Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and I think it's about time we did a little bit of a debrief in regards to the mission to Mars, the Perseverance mission that essentially landed just over a week ago from when I'm making this video. Since the original landing, a lot of new media and a lot of images, videos and even sounds have already been released, and so I wanted to mention some of them briefly in this video and also just generally talk about where this mission is headed and what's going to be happening for the next few weeks. And by the way, a lot of these images and a lot of these videos that I'm going to be using in this video, they're actually from the NASA website that has over 5,000 different raw images already released, and you can also check it out by using the link in the description below. And so anyway, it's now been over 23 years since the original mission of the first rover to Mars. The rover we refer to as the Sojourner, part of the Mars Pathfinder mission. And now, over 23 years later, after several successful missions such as Spirit, Opportunity and Curiosity, NASA succeeded once again by landing this rover that we refer to as Perseverance extremely close to the location where they intended to land it, approximately 2 kilometers away from the center. And although the original technology for landing on Mars was actually using airbags, such as the ones you see being tested right here, over the years, NASA realized that using Sky Crane, along with a relatively powerful parachute, was actually a much more efficient and a much more likely to succeed way to land things on Mars. And this is exactly what they did this time, and it was absolutely brilliant and extremely perfectly executed. But unlike all of the previous missions, this time we have actual HD footage showing us exactly what happened here, and not only allowing us to see the details of this landing, but also allowing us to thus analyze these landings in order to essentially plan this for some of the future missions involving humans. But let's actually watch this again because this is absolutely mind-blowing. So first of all, this is the deployment of the parachute, apparently one of the most powerful parachutes ever tested. Now you might have already heard about this, but the JPL team decided to put a little bit of an easter egg inside the parachute. This pattern that you see right here is binary code and it only took internet a few days to figure out what all of this was saying and what exactly it was referring to. The letters here translate to their mighty things. A phrase that's originally attributed to the former president Teddy Roosevelt that's also used as a kind of a mantra or a kind of a slogan that a lot of scientists follow at the JPL or Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But what's unusual here is that we get to see something falling off from the rover right before the parachute is released, which you can sort of see right here if I play this in slow motion. It's not entirely clear what exactly came off and if it's going to affect the mission in some way, but it happened nevertheless. At the same time, right before the parachute is released, we know that the probe was already enduring insane temperatures, probably close to about 1500 degrees Celsius or about 2700 Fahrenheit, but a few seconds later we also get to see the heat shield being released and it slowly starts falling toward the ground. Now this is actually something we've never seen before and this is an absolutely magnificent image. But unfortunately, even though we were also supposed to be getting audio from this, once again apparently the microphone failed at least the landing microphone, so we don't really get to hear anything, but we do get to see things. And once the heat shield came off, it was now the time for the flight computer to start looking for the precise location where it's supposed to try to land. It was actually trying to locate this oval shape right here that's roughly around 7.7 .7 by 6.6 .6 kilometers, or about 4.8 miles by 4.1 miles. And in the end, as you can see from this image, it was only about 2 kilometers or about mile and a half away from the center. And this is actually an amazing location to be landed in. Let me show you why. First of all, based on the images that we see here, it's right next to an ancient river delta. This is essentially where there was an ancient river flowing through this, and will thus have a lot of different sediments and a lot of different deposits. And this is also a very flat location as well. And so navigating here and also exploring this area is not going to be very difficult. It's also going to be extremely exciting, especially because it seems to be right on the bank of that ancient river. We've also received some of the first panorama shots from the probe, and it shows us that this location is, for the most part, is free of any kind of large rocks, any large boulders, or any other hazards that are usually responsible for breaking the probes or for breaking the wheels of the probes. So in that sense, NASA got super lucky with the place where they landed. 
And honestly, the landing video and of course the images from the probe are absolutely mind-blowing. Not only because this is the first time we've ever seen something like this, but also because this will allow us to now scientifically investigate what exactly happens to, for example, the Martian ground, when, as you'll see in a few seconds here, suddenly there are a lot of engines firing onto the ground in order to land something. We know that there is probably going to be a huge disturbance underneath, but how exactly it affects the ground and what exactly happens to the rocks underneath is really important for us to know in order for us to prepare for some of the future missions when we're going to be landing humans. Now these images and these videos are absolutely brilliant. You get to see everything from different angles, the landing, the suspension of the rover by the sky crane, the actual procedure that it uses to land the rover, and then you'll see it flying away any second now as it essentially escapes in order to avoid crashing into the rover. Now one of the questions someone was asking me during the stream I did last week was what actually happens to the sky crane itself? Well, we know that it crashes, and we know that it basically becomes kind of useless after that. But where it crashed is another question, and we finally have images of that too. First of all, the scientists were able to see the impact cloud as the sky crane crashed a little bit farther away from the probe. And it didn't really take them long to find out where everything else was as well by using one of the orbiters, specifically this one right here, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that has extremely powerful cameras and is able to see everything from the orbit, and even took this incredible image from the orbit showing us the landing of the Perseverance with the parachute being right here, and this being the probe with the heat shield still on. And so it turns out that it crashed approximately 700 meters away from the Curiosity probe, with the parachute being somewhere right here and the heat shield being a little bit farther away. And it only took a few days for the scientists to produce this image showing different spectra of the actual crash landing with various debris as well, showing us exactly what happens when the sky crane crashes next to the probe. And all of this is going to be extremely important for the scientists in upcoming missions when we want to land humans here. We're going to have various parts coming off rockets when the humans are landing, so it's important to understand what's going to happen to all of this and if it's going to affect the future colonies in any way as well. So this is not just for fun, this is actually science in order to plan future missions. And in terms of everything else, we know that right now the rover is doing amazingly well, everything seems to be functioning, it's currently actually testing its systems, and it's not going to be roving around or rolling around for at least another week or so. It's also currently downloading all of the necessary software that's supposed to provide all of the guidance and so on, and this will probably take approximately 4 days or so. But overall, everything seems to be working as expected, and everything seems to be functioning perfectly. Now, when it comes to the helicopter, or the flying rover known as Ingenuity, it's going to be making its maiden flight in the next few weeks or so, probably not for another month though. And as you probably know already, its main mission is to essentially test the ability of helicopters to work on Mars, and to also use the only camera on board to essentially take pictures of the nearby locations in order to plan where the rover, where the Perseverance rover is going to be going next. And once the helicopter is ready and once everything is ready to go, the rover is going to start moving around and is going to start scanning the rocks. Being the most complex rover ever made, it has extremely advanced cameras in it, which means that it can use different spectra of light and analyze these rocks just by looking at them directly. It also has a laser retro reflector on it and a few other advanced tools in order to analyze certain samples a little bit more thoroughly just to see if there are any signs of past life or possibly even signs of current life there as well. In other words, it has a lot of tools on board that do allow for the biosignature analysis. But as you might already know, this is just part one of the mission that is going to be retrieving some of these samples after they're collected by Perseverance. In about six years, NASA is planning to start launching the second part, the retrieval part of all of the samples that are going to be cached inside this little part that you see right here. Several samples are going to be stored in here that are then literally going to be rocket launched by another probe that's going to be landing here sometime around 2030. But the mission itself is still being planned and there isn't even an agreed upon design just yet. And last but not least, while Perseverance was testing its abilities and while it was basically preparing for all of the other missions, it was also able to record certain sounds on the surface of Mars and send back the sounds of Martian atmospheres already. In other words, one of the microphones is actually working. And well, let's listen to what all of this sounds like.
And if we remove the background noise, this is what all of this sounds like without the noise. So maybe not super exciting, but definitely really, really cool. You do get to hear the winds of extremely thin atmosphere of Mars. But this is obviously not the first time we heard all of this, because even the previous mission, the one that's still operating on the surface known as Inside, was able to send us a lot of different sounds as well. But in the next few weeks, we're going to be seeing and hearing a lot more and probably a lot of really, really exciting things. When the helicopter gets to fly, this is probably going to be the most exciting part of the entire mission. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more things we'll be discussing around the time when the Chinese Tianwen-1 mission is going to be landing on Mars as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the upcoming landing of the Tianwen-1 mission by China. The mission that's kind of secretive in the sense that we don't really know much about it. But I wanted to discuss things that we do know and also talk about the main goals of this mission as well, simply because we've talked about the NASA's Perseverance mission, but we haven't really discussed the Chinese mission just as much. So before it lands, let's find out what China is planning here and also find out all of the other details we know so far. Starting with the only video that we have of the mission profile explaining what is going on and what's going to happen. Now the video itself is in Mandarin, but in a nutshell, this is a mission that's going to be using a very similar profile to some of the previous NASA missions, specifically the InSight and the Viking missions, where the lander itself is not really going to be relying on any kind of a sky crane or any kind of a airbag technology like the previous missions from NASA, including Curiosity, Perseverance, or in this case, using um, airbags, this was the Mars Pathfinder missions. Without knowing the details of how the scientists in China were actually deciding this, we can only imagine that they basically went with the safest profile possible. The missions with the most success all used a very similar approach. The approach that started with the Viking probes back in the 1970s. Here is actually an iconic picture of Carl Sagan with one of the Viking landers that in 1970 landed on Mars and was able to do a little bit of science. This is actually when we originally also had this very interesting experiment that might have discovered the life on Mars. Although since then it also created a lot of controversy, mostly because it was a chemical reaction that could have had other explanations. But this is also something that hopefully the Perseverance mission will help us resolve once and for all. The experiments conducted by Perseverance will most likely help us understand what actually happened back then. And so just like the Viking probes, the initial approach will be using a heat shield, which will then be released. It will also obviously involve a parachute. And so all of these initial steps will be very, very similar to some of the previous missions. But this is when things become different. And here I'm going to cheat a little and use the animation made by NASA of the inside probe because the mission profile is very similar. Once the probe is ready to land, it's essentially going to release the lander directly without using any kind of a sky crane or anything and will then use its own propellant and its own engines using most likely hydrazine to essentially slow down as much as possible and use a tripod configuration as you see right here to basically gently land on the surface of the planet. Kind of similar to what you see right here, except that even though it does resemble this particular inside probe, the probe itself, the Chinese Tianwen one, does look slightly different. With this right here being the best representation of this particular probe. But unlike the inside probe, it also obviously has a rover here. And the prototype of this rover was originally displayed at the International Astronautical Congress, which was in Germany back in 2018, and this is sort of what it looked like. And so it's obviously a lot smaller in size, significantly smaller as a matter of fact, than any of the NASA rovers which are basically the size of a small car. And because it's so much smaller, all of this weighs a lot less which is exactly why the Chinese scientists are able to use this mission profile. This right here only works with some of the smaller missions when the payload is not actually that heavy. With heavier payloads, this no longer works, which is why NASA had to improvise and for their Pathfinder mission had to initially use airbags, later on discovering that a sky crane technology was even more efficient at landing heavy objects. So the sky crane used by NASA is really the only way we think we can do this right now with some of these heavier missions. Obviously by landing an even bigger rocket we might be able to land 
heavier payloads, but we don't really have any Martian rockets yet. So this right here is sort of the peak of landing heavy objects on Mars. Also, the other main difference between this mission and some of the previous NASA missions is in what was being launched from planet Earth. The mission itself consists of four different things. There is the orbiter, that's this part right here with the solar panels. The lander itself, that's inside this capsule with a heat shield. The rover that's inside the heat shield. And interestingly, which is not shown in this image, also a deployable camera. A camera that was meant to be released while the mission was moving toward Mars, and then snap a few shots of the orbiter as it essentially approached Mars. Or in other words, it was literally trying to produce a selfie. And it was able to do so in this picture right here, although I guess the quality and the resolution is not really that good. But it's China's first attempt, so I guess we can kind of forgive them. Also, even though the rover itself is relatively small in comparison to other NASA missions, this probe right here is one of the heaviest objects ever launched to Mars. This weighs almost 5 tons and contains a lot of things on the inside, including 13 different scientific instruments. Because remember, unlike NASA's Perseverance mission, this is both the orbiter and the rover. But unfortunately, unlike NASA's missions, the profile here is only set for about 90 days maximum. Or in other words, the rover itself will only be able to operate for about 90 days successfully, and after this, the scientists don't really know what's going to happen to it. Although we're talking about Martian days, so technically it's like 93 or something Earth days. Here's actually another video that was released by the Chinese agency not so long ago, showing us the video of the probe entering the orbit of Mars. Now this is a time-lapse video, meaning that it's obviously uh, accelerated, but it still kind of looks pretty cool. And so we know that the mission itself is definitely doing well so far, but there are still a lot of questions. Such as, for example, where exactly is it going to be landing? And based on some really circumstantial evidence, including some of the tweets that were deleted later, actually it wasn't tweets, it was from the Chinese platform, the current assumption is going to be somewhere right here, not so far away from the landing of the Viking 2 probe, in the Martian area known as Utopia Planitia, that sort of looks like this. This is a picture from the Viking 2 back in 1979. But none of this is certain yet, and things might change as the mission progresses, mostly because at this point, China is going to choose the safest possible location because they are absolutely terrified of failing this mission. At least that's what I've been hearing from other sources from China. And there are two possible locations chosen inside this site known as Utopia Planitia, depending of course on how the mission progresses. But the mission itself, and also what's happening in China in the last few years, is actually sort of exciting and sort of worth following. First of all, the entire mission from the initial stages of planning up to basically the launch and now being in orbit of Mars took only six years. And although a lot of it was based on the experience and the failure of the Russian slash Chinese Phobos grant mission from I think back in 2011, I think that's when the mission failed, with the Chinese satellite being right here actually. For the most part, the entire mission was actually planned by the Chinese scientists almost entirely independently from anyone else. On top of this, China is definitely trying to create a lot of excitement in the country about Mars and potential future Martian missions, and this can be directly seen in the opening of this really interesting place known as the Mars Camp, located in a desert in China, specifically in the region right here known as Qinghai. And that place sounds absolutely awesome. It's sort of like a theme park where you get to explore what it might feel like living on Mars. You can learn more about this by reading the blog post I'm posting in the description below. But in a nutshell, it's sort of meant to create excitement and of course create an opportunity to educate of basically Mars and what it might be like to live on Mars. And so once the travel around the world resumes, this is probably going to be one of the first places I want to visit. Because interestingly, some of the recent pictures make this place look absolutely ridiculously cool. Like this is basically something out of Star Wars. I mean, just look at how awesome this looks. But you can learn more about this through the link in the description. Although not before I show you this, this is just absolutely mind-blowing. Also, this is pretty cool too. Anyway, so this place exists and it seems and sounds really, really awesome. But that's sort of to give you an idea of where China is headed. They are definitely set on Mars and potentially landing on Mars, establishing a colony on Mars, and maybe even becoming a leader of exploration in terms of Mars. We know that NASA is still kind of struggling to come up with the funding and obviously is struggling to even maintain its annual funding. And so in that sense, 
it's probably going to be the new space race, and that is actually a good thing. We know that the last space race led to the exploration and the landing on the moon, and so if all goes well and the competition becomes intense, we might actually see people landing on Mars and maybe even establishing a colony here in our lifetimes. And so that's right, I'm actually encouraging the competition between NASA and Chinese Space Agency. But for China, this mission is important for other reasons as well. First of all, it's going to be marking its 50th anniversary of the initial space launch of this satellite right here, known as Dong Feng Hong 1, that was initially launched back in 1970. And this is a huge launch for China and actually has a, an extremely interesting story behind it that I'm going to be telling you in another video. So make sure to subscribe not to miss this story. The story does involve a very interesting American scientist and also actually a founding member of the JPL or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that initially helped make this happen. And he's also one of the most famous people in China, but is practically unknown in the US. Anyway, that's a story for another day. The story for today is that this is a huge, huge thing for China. It's something that they all take extremely seriously. And despite this just being the first mission for China, it's already really complex. It has a lot of goals, it also has a lot of scientific instruments, including a ground radar, a powerful soil analyzer that's somewhere underneath this, and even the part that's going to be storing soil samples for the retrieval by missions that are going to be landing here in 2030. So in that sense, it's actually kind of similar to Perseverance rover, but just in a much smaller scale. It also has several parts from other countries as well, like there is an Austrian magnetometer in there, and a few other parts that were developed in collaboration with other countries. And the goal here is of course to, well, basically look for signs of life on Mars. A lot of the parts were made specifically designed for this. But naturally, all of this will depend on the success of the landing, and that's the hardest part. And we're not really going to know what's going to happen to this until possibly a few more months. And if you're watching this from the future, well, you probably already know what happened. Either way, it's a super exciting mission and something that I personally am definitely looking forward to and something that I'm going to be making a lot of videos about. But before I finish this video, I also wanted to mention a little bit more about the name of the mission, Tianwen-1. And this was a poem originally written by this guy right here, known as Chu Yuang. He lived over 2000 years ago, but he's a prominent Chinese author and he's also extremely well known for his poetry and for also asking a lot of really interesting philosophical questions. One of those questions was in regards to heavens. Tianwen is the name of one of these poems, and in that poem he questions and in some way also doubts the traditional concepts of heavens in China. In other words, it's sort of a symbolic representation of the poem itself, to question the reality and to try to find out what's going on out there in the night skies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and it looks like the congratulations are in order for the Chinese Space Agency. They've managed to become the first ever nation to land a rover and to successfully complete a multi-stage mission with an orbiter, a lander and a rover, all done in a single go. And this is pretty much the first time anyone's ever been able to do it. But even though the lander itself landed on Mars approximately three days ago, it took quite a while for us to officially get the pictures confirming the landing. And interestingly enough, during this time there was obviously a lot of speculations suggesting that maybe it just didn't survive the landing, even though all of the data received from the mission and all of the data relayed by the Chinese scientists suggested otherwise. And now we finally have those pictures because, well, it obviously took a while to transmit them. So first of all, these right here show us the actual separation of the lander from the orbiter itself. And this comes in two different versions, although unfortunately not super high quality versions, showing us when the orbiter is separated from the lander, or essentially when this upper part right here separated from the bottom part that is still orbiting Mars right now as well. And here's kind of what they look like together after the solar panels are extended. But then within the two days, the cameras from the lander transmitted the images to the orbiter, which then transmitted images back to China. And this is kind of what we got. So we have the picture right here. And then we have the picture from the other side. This is essentially the railing that is going to be used by the rover in approximately three days from when I'm making this video to get down to the surface of Mars for approximately 90 days. This is essentially the time limit for this particular mission. Although naturally it might last much longer and might actually transmit images and a lot of other data for as long as a year or even longer than that. 
Now for China, and actually for the rest of the world, this is a pretty exciting achievement. Now first of all, China becomes the second ever nation to land a rover on the surface, mostly because a lot of previous missions, including most recently the European Union mission, more or less failed. They either crashed on Mars or they had a problem on the approach to Mars. And although originally a lot of scientists estimated that the success chance here was about 50%, it definitely looks like China has learned from the mistakes of all of the previous missions and managed to pull it off after all. So my sincere congratulations to all of the scientists you see right here in this picture which participated in the planning and the execution of this mission. But naturally because China generally doesn't provide a lot of information right away and because there's never really a live feed or any kind of a stream going on, there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered and a lot of things that are going to be relayed to planet Earth for the next few weeks as well. Although apparently in China they did have a TV program transmitting all of the images and all of the interviews, the program that China referred to as Ni Hao Mars, or Hello Mars, which I guess also means that if I ever make a Chinese channel, I'm going to be saying Ni Hao Wonderful Person. Anyway, moving on. So the mission definitely survived those 7 minutes of terror when we don't really get any communication or any information from the lander itself as it enters the atmosphere and has to land itself automatically. For both Perseverance and Tianwen-1, all of this had to be done autonomously, and for China especially, a lot of the risk here came from the fact that they actually never used any kind of heat shields in uh, previous missions, mostly because they only landed on the moon where there is no atmosphere, and also because they had to use parachutes, which have also never been used. But due to the combination of planning, a lot of planning, and of course, learning from the mistakes of others, plus a little bit of luck, they managed to succeed and the rover is now there with the landing itself maybe signifying the beginning of a new space race, the space race to Mars. Now as I mentioned previously, the mission is going to be using this rover for at least 90 days, and it's officially going to start around May 22nd with the rover making its way down the railing and beginning the exploration by first taking a few pictures, taking the selfie and also the picture of the lander itself, and then analyzing a few rocks around the site. Now interestingly, even though it doesn't actually look that big on this picture, this rover is surprisingly big in size. It's approximately 180 centimeters in height, which is over 6 feet tall, and it's also about 240 kilograms in weight, or roughly around 530 pounds. And so the fact that they were able to land this on the planet is quite impressive. And as you might have already heard, the name for this rover is Zhurong. And interestingly, Zhurong in Chinese mythology is somewhat equivalent to Prometheus in Greek mythology. And if you forgot, Prometheus was the god that stole fire from the heaven and gave it to the humans. But in case of Zhurong, a lot of historians today argue that Zhurong might have been an actual person. And the person here was responsible for creating fire, most likely by rubbing two sticks around and also managing the fire and basically using fire for various purposes. But eventually acquired this kind of a godlike status because, well, I guess back in the days, nobody really knew how to control fire. And so Zhurong in Chinese mythology is seen as a kind of a god of fire, with several important people in Chinese history named after him, and also this thing right here is also Zhurong as well. With Mars of course being the planet of fire. So the name kind of matches naturally. And for those of you who are actually learning Chinese, you probably already know this, but the Chinese name for Mars is basically fire star. And that's essentially where Zhurong comes in. Now, in terms of where it landed, the Planetary Society recently created this beautiful infographic pretty much showing us all of the landers and rovers on Mars. You can sort of see the Perseverance is right here in the Jezero crater, and if we go a little bit to the east and also a little bit to the north, we'll come upon a location known as Utopia Planitia. This is actually where the Viking probe landed as well. And in this region, that sort of looks like this, and that's by the way a picture from the Viking 2 probe back in 1979. There are quite a lot of really interesting discoveries already. First of all, we know that this is a site of an extremely large impact crater, approximately 3000 kilometers in diameter. At the same time, NASA has already discovered huge amounts of underground ice in this region, equivalent to a really really large lake, and so a lot of these reasons make this region an excellent opportunity to explore for a potential human mission in the future. While at the same time this region was also most likely covered by a relatively large ocean billions of years ago, so there are definitely a lot of things for the Chinese mission to explore here. They'll most likely be looking for signs of previous water, they'll also be looking for signs of possible ice not so far from the surface, and that's because the rover also contains a penetrating radar that's going to be able to scan the ground underneath and the mission is also going to be testing a lot of technologies 
for the part 2 of the Tianwen 2 mission that's going to try to retrieve some of the samples from the surface. So basically China is planning part 2, the sample retrieval mission. And so overall this is definitely a pretty exciting achievement and considering the fact that this is the first time in history where all of the Martian missions were successful, this definitely could be the new era of human space exploration and hopefully it actually keeps going. And hopefully the politics don't get in the way and stop this from happening. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be continuing our discussion about the Perseverance rover currently on Mars doing a lot of really interesting science. And in this video I wanted to give you some updates including some of the recent pictures published by NASA because officially the rover has already started scanning and analyzing different rocks with the next step being the launch of the beautiful helicopter known as Ingenuity sometime in the next month or so. Which by itself is going to be super exciting and also is going to be one of the bigger achievements of this mission. But let's start with some of the better pictures that NASA released in the last few weeks. And let's start right here with an aerial overview of where the rover landed in the location that's now referred to as the Octavia E. Butler landing site. And in the last few weeks NASA was able to locate all of the parts including the parachute, the descent stage, the heat shield and show us exactly where they are now and where they landed. And in case you were wondering and wanted to see where the rover is in comparison to everything else, NASA's free application known as Eyes on the Solar System allows you to see exactly where the rover has landed and even takes you through some of the other missions here as well. And in the last few weeks the rover has already started rolling around, having finished all of its major testing and is thus now ready to start its journey across the Martian fields. Right now NASA is planning to take this particular path you see on the screen, which will help the rover investigate several different ancient environments that according to NASA could have been once habitable. The rover is going to start at the cliffs defining the base of the delta produced by an ancient river and the path will then take the rover up across the delta toward a possible ancient shoreline deposits. It's also going to attempt to climb up the 2000 feet or 600 meter high rim of the crater and is then going to try to explore the surrounding plains. All of this should take approximately one Martian year or possibly about two Earth years. And just to give you a bit of a comparison here, the crater in the middle is roughly around one kilometer or about 0.6 miles in diameter. And as it's traveling around and as it's essentially crossing all of these locations, it's going to be using a device known as Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry, also known as Pixel. And here's a device that allows Pixel to change the angle of the imager to get the best possible results from various rocks it's going to be scanning. And a lot of new images NASA has been releasing in the last few weeks look so much better than any previous mission. They look much crisper, they have a lot more color and I was actually trying to figure out how they were able to achieve this because normally in photography, at least for the color balance, you need to somehow set it up. And interestingly, on top of the rover, NASA engineers placed a few calibration targets with specific predefined colors and contrast that a lot of these cameras used to calibrate images and adjust for various changes such as brightness in case for example a sudden dust storm or some other event occurs in the vicinity. There's even a website um, about this camera known as Mast Cam Z that tells us a little bit more about the details of the technique and also about the cameras used and how such incredibly high quality images are produced by the rover no matter what the light conditions are on the surface. And Mass Cam Z already allowed the rover to produce a very beautiful, very high quality 360 degree panorama shot that's over 200 megabytes in size. And you can actually go and download this yourself, which will allow you to see the surrounding area in extremely high detail. It was produced by taking individual shots and combining all of them into one large mosaic. And here you can kind of even see how the rover was able to produce all of this by essentially adding up every individual picture one after another. This allowed it to create an extremely accurate and very rich in color shot of the surrounding area which allowed the NASA scientists to first of all plan the pathway that the rover will be taking in the next few weeks but also allow the scientists to identify certain interesting features on the ground such as certain rocks they would like to take a look at which the scientists have already started to explore in the last few days. Here's one of many rocks that NASA identified. This one here is a wind carved rock 
that's only about two feet in diameter, something that tells us about how inhospitable and how extremely windy conditions on Mars can get once the dust storms begin. There is also this really interesting shot of what seems to be a fan-shaped deposit, and this is very likely a sediment of what's known as a delta or river delta. This is very likely where an ancient river was entering into an ancient lake inside the Jezero crater on Mars. And this is also the location where the rover is planning to go in the future. Now NASA also released this interesting video showing us the virtual visualization of the first attempt to move the rover. And this basically shows us the first steps of perseverance on Mars, with the actual tracks visible afterwards as well. And following the initial analysis of the panorama picture, NASA scientists decided that there are two possible paths the rover can take in the next few weeks. In this picture you can see them in blue and in purple. But eventually the rover is going to end up very close to the delta I showed you previously, and it's going to start heading there sometime in the next few weeks. And because the rover has 23 different cameras on board, it's going to be able to take a lot of different imagery throughout its travel. As a matter of fact, Every single day, NASA has been posting anywhere from a few dozen to several hundred pictures, all of which are available in the link you can find in the description below. And though some of the cameras like the NAF cams are going to produce better quality images, some of the other cameras like the HAS cams or hazard cameras are also going to be very useful in finding things that other cameras cannot see. But on the way to the Delta, the mission is going to essentially stop at pretty much every rock like you see right here that was done recently, and it's going to use its pixel camera to try to analyze various rocks for composition in order to discover the history of Mars and also possible signs of previous life here. The way this is done is by taking different views of the same rock, which will usually produce something like this. This is an example of another rock the NASA scientists currently refer to as Ma'az, which in Navajo language means Mars. And then by analyzing this with a camera such as the SuperCam, the scientists can determine the origin and other features of these rocks. In this case, this particular rock has been discovered to be basaltic in composition, and it's also most likely a volcanic rock in origin, consisting of different fine grains of igneous material that was cemented over time in some sort of a watery environment, once again showing us that the water was flowing through this region. But the most exciting part in the next few weeks is going to be the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Only a few days ago, the protective cover or the debris shield was released from the rover. This was protecting the helicopter during the landing. And now the helicopter is going to try to rotate down and assume a position necessary for a vertical takeoff. The Ingenuity helicopter is going to attempt its test flight sometime in the next 30 days. And the engineers have already added different locations and different parameters for this test flight, including the so-called airfield, or the area where the helicopter is going to be flying, along with the potential flight zone, all of which will be documented by one of the cameras known as High Rise on top of Perseverance rover. Here's actually another look of all of this from a different perspective, and this is exactly where the Perseverance rover is going to be in order to observe all of this. And for the Ingenuity helicopter, this is what its sort of will look like with an overlay roughly showing us where the helicopter is going to be flying. And the brief profile of the mission is, well, essentially as follows. It's going to take off, it's going to fly around, take a few pictures, and then either land in the same location as before or potentially in a new site, assuming that it finds a flat enough site somewhere in the area. And on top of this, NASA has also released several audio files allowing us to hear what it sounds like for a rover to, well, basically rover around Mars. It doesn't really sound that super exciting, so I'm not going to be playing it in this video. But you can check out the link for this in the description below. And on top of this, one of the links in the description allows you to explore some of the recent images, like this one right here from yesterday, showing us what seems to be a rock. And you're going to be seeing a lot of rocks in those pictures. Which to me at least looks extremely similar to the meteorite rock picture that was taken by one of the previous missions a few years ago. But this is definitely where the exciting part for the geologists comes in because they get to analyze these rocks by looking at them and by getting the data from the previously mentioned X-ray camera and then compare them to similar rocks we've discovered on planet Earth.
Hello and full person, this is Anton, and looks like we're going to be talking about Perseverance rover once again. NASA is really on the roll. Yet another incredible achievement has been accomplished by the mission, something that has never been done on any planet or any moon or really anywhere else outside of planet Earth. Something that involves this beautiful and unusual box you see right here. But before that, let's also quickly investigate this newly released video by NASA that shows us the dust cloud as the helicopter took off on the first powered flight on another planet only a few days ago. You can find the enhanced version of this video in the description below, but here you can actually see quite a large plume of dust um, as the helicopter takes off, and another slightly smaller plume of dust when the helicopter lands. Something that I guess is kind of expected, but nevertheless is pretty cool to see, because it's on another planet. But anyway, so what's in a box and what did NASA achieve? Well, this particular video and this particular mission relates to something known as in-situ resource utilization, also known as ISRU for short. One example of this would be some sort of an autonomous robotic excavation and processing of Martian soil in order to, for example, extract water or even construct the buildings where the future astronauts will be living. At the same time, it also involves the production and storage of various cryogenic materials such as oxygen and methane, which would then be used by rockets landing on Mars in order to take the astronauts either to other parts of the solar system or, obviously, back to planet Earth. And there are actually quite a lot of other ISRU concepts that NASA already has in development, many of them for the lunar mission, and a lot of them are for the Martian mission. But the idea is pretty simple. You want to be able to create resources from the stuff that's already where you're going. Obviously so that you don't have to bring all of this stuff with you wherever you are going. So, for example, if we land on the moon, we want to be able to produce water, oxygen, and possibly even food directly on the moon so that we don't actually have to haul it there all the way back from Earth. Mostly because every single pound that we bring with us is actually really expensive. But naturally, you want to start small, you want to start with baby steps, and you also want to start with small experiments that you bring along with other missions. With the Ingenuity helicopter being one of these missions, and the device known as MOXIE being the other. And this one here is a lot more exciting. Because once again, NASA just made history only a few days after making the history with the first flight. They were able to convert some of the Martian carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Oxygen that can naturally be used for breathing, that can be used for production of fuel, and oxygen that was essentially produced from the resources available on Mars. And remember, Martian atmosphere for the most part is predominantly carbon dioxide roughly around 95%. And this is how all of this compares to Venus and Earth. But Martian atmosphere is also very thin. It's less than 1% of the atmospheric pressure of Earth atmosphere. And so there's not a lot of CO2, but whatever is there, is there for us to use. And because Martian atmosphere is basically carbon and two oxygens, naturally there is a way for us to try to take some of the oxygen from carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen we can breathe. Or in, in some sense, you can almost think of it as reverse photosynthesis. And one of the ways we can actually take some of the oxygen away is by applying heat plus electricity to the CO2 molecule. By doing this, the oxygen does separate from the molecule, allowing us to then maybe transport it into something else. And so over the past few years, the scientists have found a pretty interesting technique that's described in many different papers, including the two I'm posting in the description below, that allows us to use nothing but electricity, heat, and a thin layer of what's known as Scandia doped zirconia ceramics that has a very specific role of extracting the oxygen ions. In this case, it's two oxygen ions with negative charge, which is first produced in this layer right here, where the CO2 is converted into carbon monoxide and the oxygen ion by applying really, really hot temperatures of about 800 degrees Celsius and by also running a current through this to separate the molecule. And as the O2 ion goes through this layer, it then gets attracted to the next layer which is positive in charge, and since the negatively charged oxygen ion is attracted to the positively charged anode, it then acquires two electrons from this anode and becomes normal oxygen. And so out of two carbon dioxide molecules, you get two carbon monoxide molecules and one molecule of oxygen. And because all of this can then be sort of layered and sandwiched into a relatively large structure, this relatively small device is actually capable of producing approximately 10 grams of oxygen per hour. Now, 
Currently, it only produced 5 grams as a test, so basically half its ROE capacity. But at its maximum capacity, it can hypothetically produce enough oxygen for an astronaut to do normal activities for roughly around 20 minutes or so. So in other words, for every astronaut, you would want to have at least three, but possibly even more of these in order to function properly. But this is a small version, and also this is just a test. So naturally, being able to produce 5.37 grams of oxygen on the first try is a huge success, which of course suggests that this technique works, and it works really well. And considering the fact that I only heard about MOXIE for the first time back in 2013, when NASA only theoretically started thinking about it, it's sort of mind-blowing to think that after about 7 years, or I guess 8 years, they were able to not just make it, but also land it on Mars, and already test it, establishing the fact that this technique works really well, and will definitely allow the scientists to use the atmosphere of Mars to easily produce quite a lot of resources right there on site. Or at least in this case, to produce oxygen. And oxygen is already needed for breathing, but it's also needed as an oxidizer for a typical rocket. And so in this case, the rocket that you see right here is actually using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen mix in order to propel itself from the planet. And so technically, we're already half there. We just need to figure out the hydrogen part now. But this was just the first step. Now, the next few steps are going to involve more advanced tests. So first of all, one of the major tests here is going to be testing MOXIE in different atmospheric conditions depending on, for example, storms, depending on different pressures, and of course different temperatures on the surface of Mars. Is it going to be able to function just as well, no matter what the conditions are? And since Mars also has seasons, like planet Earth, it's also going to be important to test this in approximately a year from now when the temperatures are going to be a lot colder. As a matter of fact, you can almost say that Mars has not four, but six seasons. It obviously has spring, winter, fall, and uh, summer, but it also has a season that some scientists refer to as perihelion and aphelion. This is related to the closest location to the Sun and the farthest location from the Sun. Because naturally, when Mars is closer to the Sun, it's going to be overall warmer. And so testing MOXIE at different times of the Martian year, which lasts for something like 690 Earth days, is really important in order to establish if it's going to be working all year long. Maybe there are certain conditions where it's not going to function well. But the scientists are really trying to push MOXIE to its limits, and they're also going to be testing it in different temperatures and also different environments, depending on where rover is located. And this is done so that we can establish the baseline for the production of oxygen and also establish any possible, as scientists call them, wrinkles or basically possible errors in order to be aware of what this device can do and what it can't do. And so overall, this whole process will take roughly around two years. And after two years, we'll hopefully have either a complete confirmation that MOXIE works as expected, or we might find some things that don't work as well. But for now, all we know is that the oxygen seems to be generated and generated quite well. And all of this thanks to this unusual layer you see in between of the materials known as ceramic oxides that at high temperatures start to attract or start to conduct oxygen ions. So if it wasn't for this particular material, this would never actually work. But the study that I posted in the description below suggests that technically, the way that the MOXIE device is designed right now, it hypothetically is capable of producing enough oxygen, and here we're talking about approximately 25 tons of oxygen, or around 55,000 pounds, that would be able to deliver a rocket back to planet Earth. And that's of course without replacing anything on the inside. And that amount of oxygen a single person usually uses in roughly around 70 years or so. So that's basically a life supply of oxygen for an average individual. Although obviously using one of these would be unrealistic. It would take close to 300 years, and by then, um, well, the batteries used on the rover would no longer be operational. Either way, the important thing is that it works, and it works pretty well. But now the goal is going to be to discover when it doesn't work. What conditions is it going to be malfunctioning in? So that's pretty much the mission for the next two years, and that's exactly what the scientists are going to try to uncover with the main goal being pushing MOXIE to its limits. But we can of course also extract oxygen from these ice caps you see right here, although according to the scientists behind this paper, it's a lot more effective to just use MOXIE. Apparently producing oxygen from the atmosphere itself is a lot more feasible and might require a lot less energy than by using electrolysis to do it from water ice or by extracting it from the ground. And so when it comes to Mars exploration and Mars colonization, 
there is a chance we might have solved at least one problem. The problem of generating oxygen. But there are obviously so many problems to go and so many things we need to still consider. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and this is Perseverance, and somewhere right there is the Ingenuity helicopter. And well, it's time for the updates and explanations on what's been going on with the incredible helicopter currently doing some really insane tricks on Mars. Okay, not actual tricks, but some really incredible achievements nevertheless. And you might have actually heard in the news that it unfortunately failed its fourth trial or its fourth flight after successfully performing three separate flights. But that's not entirely true, it didn't actually fail anything, mostly because what happened to it is essentially the same type of an error, same software mistake that it initially had before its first flight. And this is a known issue, which you can sort of learn about by watching one of the NASA streams I'm posting in the description below. In short though, just to kind of help you understand what's happening here, they discovered that there was a software bug and there were two possible solutions to this bug. Either re-upload everything, including basically the entire new operating system, or find some sort of a shortcut. And that shortcut was a command that they sent to the helicopter to essentially tell it to force start its engines. Now I'm actually oversimplifying all of this, but that's the nutshell of their solution. That solution though would only work about 80% of the time. And it just so happens that on the fourth flight they once again had the same mistake. But all they had to do is give the helicopter just a little bit more time to process its information and then try again. And essentially it worked and now the helicopter had four successful flights each of them demonstrating something a little bit more difficult every single time. So as you know already, the first flight was basically just to hover a little bit and to stay in the air at an altitude of about 3 meters. The second flight took it a little bit higher, it was about 16 feet or 5 meters above the ground and it also flew for about 51 seconds. But then it also did this, and this is actually the impressive part. It sort of tilted a little bit, moving approximately 2 meters to the side. It also did a bit of a turn and this was really important because this allowed the scientists to test its sensors which essentially use the camera that produces black and white images and these sensors are able to detect various features on the ground and then automatically use those um, features to create a map of where the helicopter is traveling. And this is actually the most impressive part in the helicopter. It's able to process these images, form a map, and it, it does so really fast. It, it has a really, really fast processor. And from what I've read, it's about 100 times faster than the processor in the Perseverance rover. So basically by processing all of these features, it builds a map and it can then even use these uh, maps to send them to Perseverance to sort of tell the rover where it should be going next. And that's one of the potential potential future missions for the helicopter. It's basically going to serve as a kind of a scout slash guidance beacon if of course the helicopter survives for at least a few more weeks. But during the third flight it achieved something even more impressive by essentially this time flying all the way across the field for approximately 50 meters or so and then returning back to the same spot and landing once again and it was doing so at a speed of about 2 meters per second. So it was actually flying pretty fast and everything went brilliantly well. You'll actually see it returning any second now. Now this was really really beyond the expectations and at this point when the helicopter landed, this was officially all of the requirements for this mission. Essentially at the time that the helicopter landed after the third attempt, all of the plans for this mission were accomplished. And so technically the mission is sort of over now. Everything after this is an extra. So the fourth flight was an extra, and the plan now is to push the helicopter to its limits, to try to see what doesn't work. But apparently, and here's one of the more beautiful color images that the helicopter took while flying, with the shadow visible right there on the bottom. Anyway, so apparently, the scientists behind this mission were exceptionally surprised by the fact that all of the theoretical predictions of how the helicopter is going to fly have so far been basically 100% correct. They actually expected something to be different. They expected maybe the air to be a little bit different, maybe the friction or some kind of a problem with maybe static electricity, but none of this has occurred. So far, everything has been sort of as predicted. And this is really mind-blowing. It means that their theoretical models were way, way beyond expectations. And every single thing they've set out to do so far has been accomplished, which is already really mind-blowing as well. But in that particular video, they also sort of explain how the helicopter does all of this by itself. 
So first of all, the instructions have to be sent to the Perseverance first, and then the Perseverance transmits them to the helicopter. Once the instructions are set and once everything is ready to go, the helicopter does everything automatically by using this black and white camera that you see uh, taking pictures right now and sort of tracking all of the information using the camera and creating these models I mentioned previously. So basically it tracks the motion, tracks the ground underneath, and it does all of this in real time while also measuring its position, velocity, altitude, and making sure that all of the instructions are followed as they're supposed to be followed. And in this video, you can kind of see that the green here is essentially what's being tracked, whereas the red is what's being rejected. But there are a few issues with this. There is actually a limit to how fast the images can be processed, and because of this, there's a limit to how fast the helicopter can technically fly. The speed in this case is most likely to be stuck at that 2 meters per second. Anything faster, and the camera is just unable to process them fast enough, and this means that the Ingenuity helicopter is no longer able to process the information and follow the instructions correctly. Naturally, by using a faster processor and possibly some sort of a solution to this in the future, faster speeds can be achieved as well. But not in this particular helicopter, this one is just a test model. And also, obviously, because Mars is covered with dust, the camera can also kind of get dirty, and because of this dust um, accumulating on the camera lens, with time there's a chance that the tracking will probably degrade and the speed will have to be reduced even more or something else will have to be changed. But only a few hours ago from when I'm making this video, the helicopter also completed its fourth flight. We don't really have a video for this yet, it's going to be coming out soon, but the helicopter apparently took a lot of pictures while flying around. It stayed in the air for 117 seconds and flew for about 133 meters or 436 feet one way and then same distance back. So in total, it was able to travel about 872 feet or about 266 meters. So definitely quite an impressive achievement when you think about it, considering the fact that the atmosphere is only 1% of atmosphere of planet Earth. And with at least one more flight planned for the next few days, we're going to possibly even hear about some greater achievements from this mission. But at the moment, as I mentioned, everything has been completed. So now everything is basically extra. And from what the scientists mentioned in the stream, one thing that will change in the next few weeks is going to be the frequency of flights. So because the primary mission is complete here, the majority of resources are now going to be shifted to the Perseverance rover and its exploration of everything around it, you know, drilling rocks and so on. And the flight will happen maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, but just to help Perseverance, not so much for any other reasons. So the helicopter is now going to become, as I mentioned, a kind of a beacon. It's going to explore, it's going to provide potential locations for the rover to go to. And at the same time, this is also going to be an amazing test for this technique as a reliable way to explore in some of the next missions, upcoming missions in the future as well. Also, don't forget that NASA is planning to send the helicopter known as Dragonfly to the moon of Saturn known as Titan. This one is going to be relatively similar and very similar techniques will be used to move it around, but instead of using solar panels, it's actually going to have its own nuclear power generator. The RTG that you see right there sticking out from its butt. And so this mission, the one on Mars right now, is going to be a perfect opportunity to test all of these techniques. And because Titan has a very thick atmosphere and also a lot less gravity than Mars, you can actually have very, very effective flight on the surface of that planet. But there are going to be some other challenges, such as extremely cold temperatures and possibly some other problems we can't even imagine right now. Okay, um, what else? Oh yeah, so there were some really cool facts we've learned about the helicopter that I didn't know before, such as, for example, the maximum altitude or why the helicopter tends to fly at this altitude of about 5 meters. It actually has something to do with the camera once again. Through various tests, the scientists determined that the sweet spot for essentially taking pictures and tracking ground underneath was, uh, is, well, basically 16 feet or 5 meters. Anything above that and it becomes a little bit difficult, anything below that and you'll have to probably fly slower. So at the moment for this model of a helicopter, this is the perfect altitude. The other interesting question that was brought up is how long can this helicopter stay in the air? What's sort of the limit of the battery? And turns out the battery is actually not the limit at all in this case. The helicopter has more than enough battery to survive for a very long time. Apparently it's the temperature. So it turns out because of the way that the blades are spinning at like ridiculously high speeds and also because of how much processing is going on on the inside, every single second Ingenuity increases in temperature by about 1 degree Celsius. That means that after about 2 minutes it's about 120 degrees Celsius hotter. 
Those of you from the US, the boiling temperature of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So it just gets too hot to basically function. And because of this, it needs to take those breaks. And according to the scientists, two minutes right now is going to be the official limit. But they think that they can push it to fly for about 600 meters in those two minutes. That will be more than a double of distance of the current record it set. And the other question that many people had was essentially, so when do they think that the helicopter is going to be sort of officially finished? In this case, the scientists mentioned that because the helicopter is only going to be flying maybe once a week or maybe once every two weeks, at some point it's basically going to fall behind Perseverance rover. And when the distance becomes too great and they're unable to communicate, the helicopter is basically going to enter the sleep mode and essentially probably stay in that mode until the battery expires or until something else happens. And so once the connection is lost, that's when officially the helicopter part of the mission will be over as well. But one of the major changes that we're going to notice in the next week or so is the fact that we're not going to be seeing these pictures anymore. Perseverance right now is basically just standing there taking photos of the helicopter and it's not doing its primary mission. The scientists are now going to switch to Perseverance, let it roll around, let it explore, dig some rocks and so on, and it's going to let helicopter do its own thing. Which means that we're not going to be seeing this, but we are going to be hearing about it until that one day when the communication is lost and the helicopter stays behind. But even with that assumption, the scientists still expect it to function for possibly a few months, maybe even a year. And so its main mission is going to be flying around, taking the uh, imagery, creating the maps, sending those maps to Perseverance and letting it plan ahead where it's going to be moving. But one day it's going to fall behind, unfortunately. And so sometime in the next few months, NASA is probably going to tell us that the helicopter is officially lost. That's going to be sad, but also it's already achieved so much, so we're not going to be that sad. Now, before I finish this video, I also wanted to mention the fact that apparently, and this might actually apply to those of you who are programmers or have used GitHub in some capacity, since a lot of the software used um, in Ingenuity is open source, or actually all of the software, they are now giving away these badges that pretty much all of the people responsible for making that software are going to receive. It's this cute badge you see right here. And so if you are using GitHub and if you ever contributed to any open source project that this mission is using, you automatically get this as a gift. And even though I've used GitHub and contributed to some open source projects, it was not the ones for the mission, so I never got it. And that's kind of unfortunate. It's a really cool badge. But anyway, those of you on GitHub, check out your profile. You might have that badge already. And since 12,000 contributors are responsible for making this mission happen software-wise, well, it is actually a kind of a nice reward. Nothing financial, obviously, but still a cool reward nevertheless. And these are just some of the open source modules that were used in creation of the Ingenuity software. Anyway, so we still have at least one major flight to go that is going to be documented and filmed by Perseverance. And after this, we're going to be hearing more and more about some additional flights, which will probably be achieving something else as well. But for now, well, technically, the mission is officially complete. Definitely an incredible achievement. And well, there are no words to express how most of us probably feel about this. This is just really, really incredible. Now, all of the videos I'm using are actually from the JPL channel. You can find this in the description below. And um, the stream that I mentioned is also there as well. The answers to some of the very common questions are in that stream. So it's sort of worth watching. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about Mars once again. And specifically, we're going to be discussing the study that I've talked about a few weeks ago, and a very similar study from just a few years ago, about the discovery of unusual deposits underneath the surface of Mars. The deposits that seem to suggest that there is actually quite a lot of different water, and specifically liquid water, that seem to have been discovered in many different locations around Mars with the most unusual discovery being right here in the South Pole of Mars. For some reason, there was also quite a lot of liquid deposits somewhere underneath the polar cap, and this didn't really make sense. For one simple reason, it's really, really cold here. For liquid water to actually exist, it has to be in some really unusual form, or it has to be somehow warmed up. So one implication was that maybe it was actually warmed up by volcanoes or some sort of a tectonic activity underneath where there was a lot of warmth coming from the inside the planet. But the only visible signs of volcanic activity on the Martian surface are actually much farther north, and mostly in the region that you see right here known as Tharsis. So volcanoes don't actually exist near the poles of Mars, 
which also means that there is very unlikely to be any tectonic activity underneath the South Pole. So what exactly was warming up the water then, and how was it staying liquid? And because of this, this created a new mystery that the scientists were trying to solve for the past few years. But more and more of these unusual patches were discovered in some of the recent studies, with some of them being relatively shallow in terms of the actual depth, which really made no sense. Liquid water should not actually exist in those regions of Mars. And so because of this, a lot of different propositions started to be made that maybe it was water. Maybe it was actually something entirely different. But what exactly could it be? Well, it actually could be many different things, but it had to be something that can actually exist on Mars. But first of all, it's important to understand how is it that these discoveries were made. They were not made by a rover that drilled into Mars and found something liquid inside. And instead, all of this was done by a mission known as Marsis and a satellite known as Mars Express that orbits around Mars and is able to use its radar to try to scan the upper surface of Mars. Now, when the radar receives unusual reflections, by comparing these reflections from what we know on the planet of Earth, we can usually determine what we've discovered. And so some of these reflections right here resemble something that kind of looks like water on planet Earth. At least the water we usually find underground. But it's obviously not the only thing that can create these types of reflections, and so scientific teams decided to kind of get to work and find some other materials that can maybe produce something similar. And right now we have the best possible explanation slash propositions that was made by the team from the York University in Canada, with the actual explanation making a lot of sense. It's very likely not water, not liquid water. It's something a little bit more boring, I guess. It's clay. And specifically, the type of a hydrous aluminum silicate clay known as smactite mineral. Which is a type of a clay that's quite common on the planet here, and it's also quite common on Mars. As a matter of fact, the Curiosity rover has discovered this type of a clay in a lot of different locations. And it discovered quite a variety of different clays in the crater known as the Gale Crater, with a lot of different papers a few years ago exploring this in further detail. This one here you can find in the description below. But I guess it's kind of important to briefly sort of go through the idea of clays or clay minerals. So what exactly are they and why are they important and what exactly does this mean for Mars? So I think for most of us when we hear clay we kind of think of maybe two things. Something like this, maybe something like this, but also the clay that we use to produce various types of clay pottery. As you probably know clay was extremely important for the early human civilizations and a lot of early human civilizations have used clay for various purposes. We obviously had clay pottery, we also had clay tablets, and some of the earliest forms of writing, counting, math, and a lot of other types of expression were all done on clay. But generally speaking, clay is important for other reasons as well. Today it's also believed that clay very likely played an important role in the creation and the evolution of early life. There are actually quite a lot of different suggestions and a lot of studies that even go as far as to say clay might have been the place where life began. This one is also in the description below. But what exactly does this mean? And what exactly is clay to begin with? Now I'm sure someone out there, someone in the description is going to explain this in more detail. But generally speaking, clay is basically a mixture of different things. It's a mixture of a few metals, it's a mixture of silicates, and also other things like iron, magnesium, and so on. And all of this usually is in different proportions and sort of accumulates into tiny tiny particles that are usually about 2 micrometers in size. And these particles then create these hexagonal sheets that you see right here and then also require water to connect everything together and to create what we refer to as clay. But depending on the mixture and depending on the amount of materials, clays can then be subdivided into a lot of other groups, with one such group known as smectites. And the original discovery of smectites on Mars back in 2013 was a huge discovery. It meant that at some point in the past, Mars very likely had conditions present that could have easily supported the evolution of life. And the amounts of clay discovered so far suggested that these conditions were present in many different regions and for a pretty long time. And so because we knew that smectites on Mars definitely exist, but liquid water very likely doesn't exist, here, the scientists behind this paper decided to go with the Occam's razor. The simplest explanation sometimes is the best. Could it actually be smectites producing these unusual reflections from Mars? And you can probably already guess, the answer is definitely yes. So here's what the scientists did to try to prove this. First, they purchased a bunch of commercially available clay minerals, specifically this one right here known as calcium montmorillonite, which have already been suggested to be widely present on the surface of Mars as well. 
Then they took these crystals and put them in conditions very similar to what we would probably find underneath Mars. And here we're talking about temperatures of about minus 43 degrees Celsius or about minus 45 Fahrenheit. And then they measure the property known as dielectric permittivity, which is pretty much the same way that the Mars Express is able to actually sense some of these materials underneath the ground. And then by comparing this to the actual observations, they were able to work out what sort of possible types of smectites could produce very similar observations to what Mars probe was able to see as well. And as you can probably imagine, they did sort of match. At least matched enough to suddenly make a lot of sense. In this case, providing the best possible explanation. Or at least the most plausible explanation. We already know that these clays exist on Mars. As a matter of fact, there seem to be a lot more of them in the southern part of Mars. And at the same time, the reflective properties of these clays when they're frozen to minus 43 degrees Celsius match quite directly to what was observed by the probe on Mars. And because up to about 50% of the Martian surface is actually covered in these types of clays, it would definitely make sense. A lot of sense. Way more sense than liquid water. Especially because the liquid water underneath Mars still does not have any good explanations or any viable mechanisms that can maintain the liquid water underneath. But if there was a layer of clay and it was only about 1 meter or maybe 3 feet in thickness, and if that clay was at a temperature of about minus 43 degrees Celsius, it would reflect the radar just as much as liquid water. At least according to the study right here. But it doesn't mean that there is no liquid water underneath Mars. It's still possible that some of these patches are actually liquid water deposits. But the ones underneath the South Pole would be extremely difficult to explain. It's much more easier to explain if they're a little bit farther north. At least there we know that there is possible volcanic and tectonic activity underneath the surface. While at the same time the detection of clays underneath the Martian surface also suggests that there were very likely many periods during the Martian evolution when there was a lot of liquid water on the surface which provided a lot of possibilities for life to kickstart on the planet. And so the fact that it's actually clays and not water doesn't really make it more boring. As a matter of fact, it kind of makes it more exciting. It means that the clay deposits and the clay itself was created and deposited during many different time frames in the existence of the planet. And so there were possibly a lot of chances for life on Mars to actually kickstart and to possibly exist for millions of years. But these types of clays have also been discovered on a lot of other objects out there, including the dwarf planet Ceres, and the moon of Jupiter known as Europa. And since Europa is the other target for the potential search for extraterrestrial life, for all we know, maybe these clays are actually the connection between all of these objects. For all we know, maybe it's the clay that actually sort of helps life to form and to evolve. And for all we know, maybe we should be actually looking for clay on other planets as well. Not oxygen, not some strange gas, clay. And so, in that sense, it is a pretty exciting discovery, and of course, a very important reason for why we should try to one day colonize Mars, at least to some extent. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be trying to resolve one of the bigger mysteries of planet Mars. At least, that's what the paper in the description below tries to do. The mystery, of course, well, let's see if you can guess what it is. Although I bet you've already guessed based on the title. The mystery is right here in this picture. The beautiful picture taken by the Perseverance rover of what appears to be an ancient river delta. Yet at the same time, it's in the middle of what seems to be a completely deserted place. There's nothing here, there's no water, and there's really no possibility of having water in the current conditions on this planet. But the sign is still there, suggesting that this place was filled with rivers and possibly even deep oceans as well. So how is it possible that Mars used to have liquid water, yet today it's basically a deserted and barren planet? Now obviously one potential answer is that, well, it might have had thicker atmosphere, and maybe the sun was warmer or producing more heat, and well, maybe there was a combination of things that we just don't understand yet. But none of this is very specific and very conclusive. So really, how is it that Mars used to have liquid oceans? Now the most common answer today is that it was either A, it was maybe only possible during some major collisions, like the one you saw right now, that would heat up the planet just enough to cause the liquid oceans and rivers to flow on the planet. So in other words, maybe it was only during the so-called late heavy bombardment or some other era when the planet experienced a lot of different collisions. But that of course means that these rivers or these lakes would only exist for maybe a couple of years maximum. This would not really explain how 
a river delta like this would form. This would probably require at least a few hundreds of years. So the collision explanation is not really that good. It does not explain everything we're observing. However, it does explain some of the observations from the surface, such as, I don't know if I can find it here, actually I'm gonna have to cheat and use one of the other pictures. This picture right here from the study I discussed a few years ago that shows us the outlines of ancient tsunamis that created these really, really large deposits. And the scientists a few years ago discovered what seems to be the crater responsible for creating these tsunamis. It was most likely from a collision by a really large asteroid that hit the planet right in the middle of the ocean. Which of course implies that the ocean was already there. And so if not the collisions, there was probably something else happening here. The only other explanation we can think of are a lot of greenhouse gases. But usually greenhouse gases, or at least certain gases, produce um, chemical reactions on the surface. And just based on what the scientists have studied so far, none of these gases really explain the presence of the water once again. At least not to the extent where it would make Mars warm enough and have enough atmosphere to basically have the water. So for example, we know that Mars has a little bit of methane on the surface, but methane generally gets destroyed in the atmosphere pretty quickly. So as a greenhouse gas, it's not really that good to maintain for a very, very long period of time, unless a lot of methane was produced by something on Mars. We also know that carbon dioxide, CO2, is an excellent greenhouse gas, but you need to have a lot of it, way more than Mars currently has, and this would also create certain signs on the surface that would basically show us that Mars was very different and very CO2 rich. This is not what scientists observe currently. Then we have gases like nitrous oxide, ozone, CFCs and HCFCs or hydrofluorocarbons, and there are no signs of any of those on Mars either. So what else do we have? Well, one of the most potent gases is actually water. Water gas is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. But in this case, you would need to have a lot of it and it would need to stay in Martian atmosphere long term to create these necessary conditions. And so can this be our answer? Well, as a spoiler, the answer is yes. But there is a much more detailed and more interesting answer that I'm going to discuss right now. So first of all, in order for greenhouse gases to actually do their work, they do have to stay in the atmosphere long enough. So like I mentioned, methane is just not in the atmosphere long enough on Earth to play a big enough role. Usually it's destroyed by oxygen really quickly. Then a lot of other gases like ozone, even though they are also greenhouse gases, they're just not present in large enough quantities to make a difference. But at the same time, when it comes to Mars, because of its distance from the Sun and also because of the history of the Sun, it would need to have a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases to be much warmer than it is today. And it's also important to remember that back then, approximately 3 to 4 billion years ago, the Sun was actually much, much cooler on average. It produced approximately 30% less light. This is today known as the faint young Sun paradox. The paradox being the fact that we know that Mars and Earth seem to have had water on the surface, but back then the Sun was just much cooler. This graph right here, specifically this part, shows you how the solar luminosity and the amount of energy produced by the Sun changed in the last few billions of years. Now this of course implies that Mars was receiving a lot less solar energy back in the days. And it also implies that it needed a lot more atmosphere and a lot more greenhouse gases to have warm enough conditions on the surface. So this basically creates a paradox that's kind of currently impossible to answer. But the paper in the description might have actually found one answer that doesn't break any laws and presents something really interesting nobody ever considered. It does consider the water vapor as the potential explanation to everything. Now, first of all, when it comes to clouds, most of our understanding of how clouds are created and also what they do to the planet really comes from planet Earth. And we do seem to have different types of clouds possible from clouds forming on Mars or really any other planet. Now, our clouds generally can be classified as relatively low altitude and also somewhat reflective. In other words, for the most part, the clouds on the planet reflect the light and thus lower the temperature of the surface. The more clouds our planet has, the cooler the surface should technically get. And so by increasing the amount of water vapor, the planet can generally regulate its own temperature. So higher water vapor means more clouds, means lower temperature, which then leads to more precipitation and the cooling of the planet. This is normally how the planet self-regulates. But in order to try to explain how Mars could have similar conditions, the previous papers established that this would require some really unusual, very, very thick clouds 
in somewhat unusual altitudes which could not possibly exist on Mars. In other words, the water vapor clouds did not really explain anything in some of the previous studies. And so generally the scientists abandoned this idea, thinking that something else was happening on the surface. But the scientists in this paper used a global climate model to try to simulate something a little bit different, and they did discover something really interesting. They were able to model Martian surface with an average temperature of just around minus 8 degrees Celsius, which would generally be enough to have at least some water on the surface. And they were also able to simulate this for approximately several hundred years, suggesting that there was a way for Mars to maintain these conditions with just water vapor. But what did they do different and how was their Mars different from previous experiments? Well, first of all, the water on Mars could not be this way. It could not be everywhere. Their Mars had to be extremely patchy. The water only existed in certain locations. And some other locations had to have a lot of ice present on the surface as well. As a matter of fact, if there was a lot of ice present in different locations on the planet, it would create a very unusual condition on the planet compared to planet Earth. Here, the presence of ice patches around the planet, such as for example on different tops of mountains or at the poles, would create a lot of dry air all over the planet. And as the water evaporates or sublimates from these locations, it sort of starts spreading itself across the planet, going into drier regions, which would then start forming clouds. But with thinner air conditions and with colder temperatures, this would result in essentially snow, and as these snowflakes fall to the surface, they basically sublimate again and end up producing these long-term high-altitude clouds that do have a tendency to warm the planet overall. And so the presence of the somewhat dry climates with somewhat warm conditions and a lot of patchy locations with water and ice on the surface can result in a production of a thin layer of high-altitude clouds that would not actually be that easily visible and would not reflect light, but instead trap a lot of heat on the surface of Mars, thus allowing it to become warmer than it would be otherwise. And though generally thick clouds reflect light from the Sun, the thin clouds as you see in this image by NASA do create conditions that warm up the planet. And so by having a lot of these thin clouds all over the surface, Mars could have easily maintained conditions for liquid water to exist for a very, very long time. In this particular case, the scientists determined that by having these patches of water and by having the humidity of about 25%, it would be more than enough to produce enough of these clouds to warm up the entire planet to about minus 8 degrees Celsius, around 46 Fahrenheit. And considering this is an average temperature, obviously some regions would be much warmer and thus have liquid water on the surface. With a lot more water probably also coming from within Mars itself, from underground, where a lot of underground rivers could easily feed into these larger lakes, rivers and oceans, and thus allow more clouds to be created over time. And so in short, this analysis does suggest that not only do we not need any unusual explanations for how Mars was able to maintain liquid water, but it also allows us to understand what most likely happened to Mars over time and how it changed and transformed into what it is today. Obviously, since water is an excellent greenhouse gas, it would basically explain how Mars was so warm. But because water is easily broken up by solar radiation, over time all of this radiation would create a lot of hydrogen and oxygen, with hydrogen escaping into the outer atmosphere and oxygen interacting with the surface of Mars, oxidizing it and turning it red as it is today. And even though the Sun did warm up over time and increased its luminosity by about 30% in the last 4.5 billion years, this was not unfortunately enough for Mars to maintain its atmosphere. Over time, Mars lost most of its water, while also losing the majority of its atmosphere as well. But I guess the question is, well, could something like this also happen to planet Earth, and can clouds on Earth also cause these dramatic greenhouse effects? And the answer is most likely no, simply because of the way that the scientists in this paper believe the water cycle differs between Earth and Mars. So on Earth, when water evaporates, it doesn't actually linger in the atmosphere very long. It does turn into clouds, but those clouds precipitate pretty quickly. And this is because we already have so much water on the surface, and so the water cycle is extremely quick. But on a dry, warm Mars, the water evaporating would actually stay in the atmosphere much, much longer. It would maybe not even precipitate for at least a year while also having very patchy locations where water was present as well. And because of this, any clouds on Mars would most likely stay in there for much, much longer periods of time, also be very thin and barely visible, and instead of reflecting light, would absorb light, 
warming up the planet in the process. With the other major difference being the way that the water moves on the surface. On Mars, it's very likely that all of this evaporated water would most likely spread across the entire planet and create relatively similar clouds across the entire surface of Mars. This would then allow the entire surface of Mars to warm up relatively equally. On Earth, though, water evaporates and precipitates in more unequal conditions. Sometimes we have places that are deserts, where there's almost no rain. Sometimes we have places that are rainforests. And because of this, we have so many different clouds on the planet, and also so many different conditions that allow the planet to continuously maintain its water cycle. But the situation on Mars was very different, and looks like it was very unstable. Unstable enough to turn the planet into a desert world, eventually resulting in the Mars we know today. And so this paper so far presents one of the best explanations for why Mars is the way it is today, and how this unusual desert world was able to maintain warm conditions for a liquid water to exist. But it also presents an interesting opportunity for us to study how clouds actually influence planets, and how one day we might potentially use clouds to modify the climate of planets like Earth, or maybe even planets like Mars. But I'll actually be talking about this in one of the future videos, because some countries have already done so very successfully. This video right here shows us the anomalous sixth flight of the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. This is the flight that almost crashed the Martian helicopter. Hello, wonderful person. Let's talk about this anomaly, what exactly caused this, how it was resolved, and also discuss what NASA is up to with yet another mission known as InSight that's kind of facing a completely different problem as well. But more importantly, let's actually talk about how absolutely brilliant the NASA scientists are when it comes to solving these issues, even though all of these issues they're facing are happening on a planet millions of miles away from us and with a relatively long signal delay of several minutes. But let's start with the Ingenuity flight. So the sixth flight unfortunately had a major problem during the flight. But it only started happening after approximately 54 seconds of flight. As a matter of fact, the mission was able to take this beautiful shot right here. This is what Mars essentially looks like from the altitude of about 33 feet or 10 meters above the ground. And this is probably one of the most beautiful pictures of Mars we have so far. But then, after a few seconds, it started having a malfunction which essentially resulted in a major wobble that you can kind of see in this video. This is from the navigation camera that's pointing downwards. It was actually pitching left and right by up to about 20 degrees, and normally if this was just a regular commercial drone, it would have already crashed. And technically speaking, it should have crashed, but it didn't. And this is where the brilliance of NASA engineers comes in. Because the helicopter landed just fine and returned all of the data about this particular mission. And after they got the data, they realized what was happening. And remember, they only get the data only a few hours later and only get to process everything once the data from Ingenuity returns to Perseverance. Perseverance transfers it to an orbiter around Mars and the Martian orbiter transfers it back to Earth through the so-called Deep Space Network. All of this actually does take a few hours. And so what exactly happened here? Well, first of all, we have to understand how the helicopter works and what exactly it does when it starts flying. Unlike a typical drone, or a typical uh, commercial drone that is, Ingenuity is actually technically a helicopter. The way that it controls the altitude and the way that it controls its speed is very similar to how a helicopter does it. This is known as the collective angle of attack or collective control. And basically, when the helicopter starts operating, its blades start spinning at around 2500 RPM, and the actual speed does not change very much. Which is very different from a commercial drone where the speed of the actual blades controls the descent and the ascent. But in this case, what actually controls the ascent and descent is the change of the angle of the blades themselves. So when the blades are sort of parallel, like you see them right here, the rover just stays on the ground and doesn't really do anything. However, when you change the angle of the blades and increase the so-called angle of attack, that's when Ingenuity jumps into the air and starts flying. And so all of the controls of the helicopter in this case come from the control of the pitch of the angle of the blades here. And so by controlling the angle of the blades, that's how the computer inside Ingenuity is able to control everything in the helicopter. And until the helicopter reaches the altitude of one meter, all of the measurements of position and estimated altitude are actually done inside the helicopter by basically kind of making an assumption based on the known parameters of Martian atmosphere. And only once it gets higher into the air, 
That's when the computer turns on the laser rangefinder to measure the altitude and also the camera that measures the position of the helicopter. And this is to essentially prevent the dust that you see in this simulation here from basically blocking the camera and from providing wrong results. And so there are actually several different ways that the helicopter constantly measures its, its position, its altitude and its speed. And so it uses a combination of internal measurement unit which measures all of the parameters based on what the blades are doing on the helicopter or basically just by getting the reading from these things right here. It also uses a laser rangefinder and it has a downwards pointing camera that does all of this visual processing to determine the location of the helicopter compared to some of the objects it can see on the ground. But because of the nature of measurements and also because of the fact that a lot of this is based on calculations from planet Earth on what we know about Mars and not from the direct observations from Mars, or in other words, because all of this is based on theory, there are still going to be a lot of errors at all times. And you can sort of see these errors in visual processing as the red dots in this particular video. And so while all of these errors would add up pretty quickly if only one of these measurement devices was used, because they all kind of combine the information and look at data together, they sort of end up canceling a lot of the errors and allow the helicopter to perform without creating any major problems. But the thing is, when it starts flying like this, it does have a lot of reliance on the visual parameters. It actually takes a lot of pictures at all times, and every one of these pictures will have a timestamp and will also have measurements of unique points on the ground that are then used to measure the total velocity and the total distance traveled. This then communicates with the internal system and compares the errors and basically tries to cancel out any discrepancies or any mistakes. But all of this does depend on the images timestamp. Or in other words, the computer in this case processes these images based on when they arrive from the camera. And turns out when the helicopter was performing its sixth flight, after about 150 meters of flight, one of the images coming from the downward pointing camera ended up being lost and also somehow made a mistake with a timestamp with all of the following images then having a wrong timestamp in them. And because the computer algorithm is responsible for making corrections and making predictions based on what the camera is seeing and also what the internal system is seeing, it suddenly encountered a major mistake. And remember, here we're talking about approximately 30 pictures every single second. And so the entire problem was really caused by that one picture suddenly missing. And because of this, the features on the ground now suddenly had a slightly deviated timestamp in them. It's as if a helicopter was actually moving at the wrong velocity or moving in the wrong position. The computer basically sort of panicked and desperately tried to change the velocity and also the pitch of the helicopter constantly realigning it left to right. Because of this, it started shifting quite a lot and created even more additional errors afterwards. Mostly because all of the additional navigation images now had the wrong timestamp in them and things were no longer being calculated correctly. But the engineers took a lot of precautions even before they launched the mission. And one of the precautions here was to basically disable the camera during the last leg of every single mission, every single flight. So as the helicopter starts to approach the area where it's supposed to land, it will suddenly disable the navigation camera and will only once again rely on the internal system to try to land itself safely. And because of this, every single landing, so far at least, has been very smooth without any major problems. Or in other words, the scientists sort of anticipated problems in flight and also anticipated that the landing and the takeoff should be sort of isolated from all of the other operations. And because of this, Ingenuity landed normally on the ground, but not exactly in the same spot where it was supposed to land. It landed about 15 feet or about 5 meters away from the actual point where the scientists expected it to land. And so now, just like the scientists expected, they managed to push the helicopter to a completely new level and learn something else, something they did not know or anticipate, and something that will definitely be taken into consideration in some of the future missions. Although in this case, it seems to be possibly a software glitch, so it's maybe something that can be resolved by rewriting some of the code. Either way though, it's very impressive of what the scientists were able to create with this tiny helicopter and how much they've already been able to learn by just doing these six flights. So that's one of the missions I wanted to mention. But the NASA's ingenuity, literally ingenuity, does not end there. There's another mission I haven't actually talked about in a while, and it's a mission that's sort of been slowly expected to finish prematurely. The mission known as InSight. 
I haven't really talked about this mission for a while now, mostly because, well, unfortunately, it's been having some issues, and specifically issues with power. Unfortunately, the scientists did not anticipate how much dust is going to collect on the solar panels within just a few months. Now, on the left, you can kind of see how clean it used to be, and this is after only four months. And because of this, unfortunately, the NASA scientists were forced to shut down a lot of different scientific experiments, and a lot of them have started to think that maybe the mission is over. They were not really expecting it to finish so soon, and they definitely were extremely disappointed with the results so far. Especially since the mission was already able to discover some really cool things about Martian earthquakes, and even discover some other things about the internal structure of Mars as well. But someone out there in NASA had a brilliant idea, and it seems to have worked. And the idea is something that I guess nobody would ever think about, you know, how do you actually clean these panels? And before someone in the comments says, why don't we just fly a helicopter here and use the blades, or use the airflow from the blades, well, the distances here are like in thousands of kilometers. Anyway, here is sort of what they decided to do to help this mission. They took a little bit of Martian sand, and they poured a little bit of it over the panels. Okay, but why? That sounds kind of counterintuitive, wouldn't discover the panels more. Well, it turns out by doing this, because now there is also sand on the panels, the Martian wind starts pushing the sand around as well, and it actually sort of dislodges the layer of dust that accumulated on the panels. And apparently it totally worked. The energy levels in the last few days have increased, which means that the mission might have a chance after all. If they manage to do this on the other parts of the panels, by using this tiny excavating tool that you see right here, this might give Insight a second chance. It might actually work after all. Although for now, I guess it's still early to say if this is going to work on other parts of the panels as well. Technically though, it should work. By pouring the sand over those parts, it should dislodge the dust as the wind blows over it. But the solution by itself is, once again, genius. This is just brilliant thinking and a perfect example of ingenuity at work. Oh, and I guess before we finish, well, we also have China, right? And unfortunately, we're not really being told much, but the rover seems to be working, it seems to be rolling around and taking pictures, and it's going to be hopefully sending some scientific data in the next few days. Hello info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some major updates, once again, from the incredible Ingenuity helicopter currently flying on Mars or actually waiting to fly another time. Because just like with the first flight of the helicopter, NASA has just achieved something pretty incredible with the ninth flight. Something that officially cemented this little guy as one of the most incredible NASA missions ever. But let's talk about the flight 7, 8 and 9, since the anomaly of the sixth flight that was discussed in a video somewhere right there. And by the way, you can actually find the entire flight log of the helicopter in the link in the description below. So first of all, NASA realized that the glitch that was happening during the sixth flight was related to the color camera. And because of this, the color camera was disabled for the next few flights. It was essentially only using black and white camera. And so during the seventh flight, there were absolutely no problems. Here's one of the pictures taken by the helicopter during the seventh flight. It flew for approximately 106 meters, or about 350 feet, and it landed without any problems and did not really experience anything unusual. The next flight, the eighth flight, the picture from which you can see right here, was also not particularly exciting, with the helicopter safely flying for approximately 160 meters, or 520 feet. And at that point, it actually landed pretty far from the um, Perseverance rover. It was over 130 meters away, and this was already sort of pushing the limits of communication. Here's one of the pictures taken by the helicopter of Perseverance at a relatively far away distance. And so after the 8th flight, they were able to actually find a solution to the previous bug and were able to re-enable the color camera. Which meant two things. One is that they were obviously able to take really nice pictures, but they could also navigate slightly more efficiently and possibly push the helicopter to a completely new level. Which is exactly what they decided to do. They decided to initiate the longest flight of this beautiful helicopter, 625 meters or about 2050 feet. Moving at the record speed of about 5 meters per second and flying over a somewhat interesting, scientifically speaking, and also somewhat dangerous for a helicopter area. The area that you can kind of see right here. All of these little hills and all of this not so flat terrain in this region, the region the scientists currently refer to as Seta, presented a very challenging for the helicopter mission, and there's a really simple reason for that. 
The reason being the helicopter's navigation and the way it processes information. So first of all, let's take a look at the parts of the helicopter. We have the batteries right here, the sensors and cameras in this region, the avionics and the body or the brains of the helicopter right here, and then we have the solar panels, the antennas that are used to communicate with Perseverance, and of course the beautiful carbon fiber blades. Now the thing about the avionics and the cameras is that they use a very specific algorithm that processes the information from the cameras in order to determine the distance and the speed. But because the processor in this helicopter is not super powerful, they had to simplify the algorithm, making it read the data from the camera as if the terrain was completely flat. So for example, in this video right here, you're about to see what happens when the helicopter starts flying and how it sort of analyzes the terrain. As it starts to fly around and move around, it analyzes various features such as rocks or different crevices and puts them as tiny little dots that move in certain directions. But the way it's implemented is that it sort of assumed that this is flat terrain. If the terrain is not flat, if there's a hill or a lot of different crevices, a lot of different rocks and a lot of different unequal features, it's not going to know this because the algorithm assumes that it's flat. And so when flying over such a hilly area with a lot of different stuff happening here, the scientists expected the algorithm to get really confused because it thinks it's flat, but various features are going to be moving at various velocities because of the incline or because of various slopes. And because of this, the scientists estimated that the errors here will actually add up pretty quickly. In other words, the helicopter is not really going to provide a lot of very accurate data, but it's still going to be able to fly and it's still going to be able to land. And just like they expected, well, it definitely worked, but there were a lot of errors, and as a result, the helicopter landed approximately 50 meters away from the original point where they expected it to land. But look at this distance. So this right here is flights 1 to 8. And this entire yellow line is the last ninth flight, with the helicopter landing somewhere in this region right here. With the Perseverance being somewhere around this region, and it's probably slowly going to make its way around and eventually meet the ingenuity. And because of the hilliness of this particular area that the scientists refer to as Seta, these beautiful colored images taken by Ingenuity while it was flying across this area are technically priceless to the scientists, mostly because there's no way that the rover would probably even make it there. And so by using these images, they're going to be able to discover some really incredible things about this ancient river delta. Here's one of the many super detailed pictures it was able to take, showing us these unusual dunes present in this area. Now for us, and at least for me, this doesn't really tell me much, but for a professional geologist and for someone who's extremely good at telling various features apart, they're going to learn so much from these images. At the same time, because the helicopter is now a few hundred meters away from Perseverance, it's also technically pushing the limits of communication as well, as it's going to allow NASA scientists to see how far they can actually take it next time as well. And so for the next few weeks, a lot of scientists are going to be analyzing these images and are going to also look for the various features that maybe the Perseverance can try to go to and explore using some of its more advanced sensors, such as the SuperCam that you see right here, that's able to analyze things using a laser and even learn about chemical composition of various rocks by looking at them from a distance. And currently, the scientists have already identified several different locations where they would love to visit because of the potential discoveries that could be made in those areas. For example, this location where the helicopter landed that it flew over, known as the Raised Bridges, is a system of very unusual fractured formations where some scientists expect there could be some sort of an ancient subsurface habitat or possibly some really ancient deposits that existed in that area where there was still liquid water on the surface. And by using the helicopter, they've also identified several other areas that could represent some of the deepest locations in the ancient Lake Jezero when there was still water there as well. So this could be a pretty interesting discovery or a pretty interesting exploration spot in the next few weeks or in the next few months. And so it's really incredible how the Perseverance so far has actually been sort of complemented by the ingenuity and its ability to take pictures from far away. Or not really far away, but from a higher altitude. And because of this, the plan now is to try to fly the helicopter every two to maybe three weeks until at least the end of August. So that means that we're going to have at least three to maybe four more flights. Which of course also means that there are probably going to be some other major discoveries coming in the next few months as well.
But I guess for now that's kind of all we know. Now if you'd like to see some of the more recent pictures taken by the helicopter, you can find them in the link I'm posting in the description of the raw images from the NASA's Perseverance mission. And here you can basically just scroll down and directly download some of these beautiful pictures. All which of course shows us the incredible and somewhat alien looking landscape of our beautiful neighbor Mars. Hello Info Prison, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some new incredible discoveries coming from our beautiful neighbor Mars. But this time not from the surface or from the atmosphere of Mars, this time from inside Mars. Because for the first time ever the scientists have been able to analyze the structure, the internal structure of another planet. Being able to precisely measure the size of the crust, the size of the mantle, and the approximate size of the inner core as well. And even more or less determining what all of these parts are made out of. Which was actually the main purpose for the inside probe you see right here that is still sort of functioning on Mars even today. And so let's talk a little bit more about this because it's been a really good year for Mars and so many new things have been discovered in the last few months. But first of all, this probe right here. Originally when the inside probe was launched, I personally wasn't really sure how this mission is going to go. For example, I knew back then that there is not going to be a lot of public interest in this mission because it's not going to be producing a lot of high quality images and it's also unlikely to make any groundbreaking discoveries. At the same time, even within the first few weeks and few months of operation, it started to experience major problems. And so we weren't really sure if this probe is going to survive for as long as it did. But looks like I was kind of proven wrong. It did discover something the scientists were hoping to find after at least a few years of operation. It was able to successfully analyze and of course discover exactly what happens inside the planet, inside Mars. And it did so by listening to various Mars quakes. The quakes very similar to earthquakes that essentially produce two different types of waves. The compressional waves, also known as P waves, that propagate by pressing things together and increasing the density inside a typical object, and the shear waves, also known as S waves, that create a kind of an up and down motion as you see right here. The scientists have been studying these types of waves on Earth for a very, very long time, over a hundred years as a matter of fact. And it generally took the scientists approximately hundred years or so to work out how to use the differences in speed of these different waves while also listening to the reflection of these waves as they move inside the mantle and the core and as they reflect from various irregularities on the inside to eventually figure out what exactly is happening inside our own planet with extreme precision. And so by using the observations from planet Earth and using decades of experience of listening to these waves, during the Apollo missions the scientists have also been able to work out how to use this on the moon to precisely measure the internal structure of our own satellite. Although in this case it did take them roughly around 4 decades or so. But now, after only a few years of listening for various waves on Mars, the scientists have been able to work out exactly what happens inside Mars as well, making this a pretty important and pretty exciting discovery after all. But first, the probe itself. As you might have heard from some of the previous videos, in the last few months the probe has been struggling to survive. Unfortunately, because of the accumulation of dust on the solar panels, within only a year the panels went from being this to being almost entirely covered by dust. And though initially the probe was able to generate approximately 5000 watt hours of power, a week ago this has decreased to only about 700 watt hours. Which means that about 80% of power is no longer being generated. And to try to solve this, the NASA scientists have already tried so many different things. For example, they tried to shake off all of this dust by trying to vibrate and pulsate the solar array deployment motors, but unfortunately this was not very successful. It didn't really do as much as they thought it would do. Then, only a few months ago, they tried something a little bit different. Actually something really brilliant. They tried to place or try to trickle a little bit of sand by using this excavating device you see right here. And by doing this, some of the dust was actually dislodged by the sand. But when they tried to do this second and third time, the effects were much less dramatic and so this was also unfortunately not really helping anything. And so because of this, the future of this mission is currently not really certain. It still has enough energy to listen to different earthquakes and to possibly do very minor experiments, but for anything major it no longer has enough power. But despite of this, the SEIS that you see right here, also known as the Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure, was able to record close to 800 different earthquakes 
no, Mars quakes, in the last couple of years. And this of course allowed the scientists to very thoroughly study the structure of Mars, at least from the region where the probe was located. And this is actually the other interesting fact about this. The probe is located in this region known as the Elysium Planitia, the region very close to this feature known as the Cerberus Fossa. And it just so happens that the vast majority of all earthquakes that were detected by the mission came from this unusual region. Now here's what Cerberus Fossa looks like. It's an unusual formation of these fissure-like structures you see right here that looks sort of like this on the inside. In the last few years, this region has been officially identified as a seismically and tectonically active region with some sort of an outflow happening 2 to maybe 10 million years ago and even some recent volcanic deposits being as young as only 50,000 years, implying of course that Mars might have been volcanically active relatively recently. Now these strange formations are approximately 1200 kilometers across and today the scientists believe that whatever formed them very likely resulted in a huge outflow of some sort of a liquid. Now a lot of scientists think that it's probably water. Liquid water that most likely escaped from these fissures and spread across a very large area, creating these new formations you see all over the place here. But the opposing theory to this is that maybe it's actually not water, it could have also been lava, or possibly even a mixture of both. Lava may be followed by liquid water, and because of this, this is an extremely intriguing region that could potentially help scientists resolve a lot of mysteries about Mars. But as I mentioned, a lot of the earthquakes were coming from this region. Which is actually really surprising because the scientists originally expected that most earthquakes would be coming from the region known as Tarsus that has the biggest volcanoes in the solar system, including Olympus Mons you see right here. But compared to earthquakes, a lot of these Mars quakes were extremely weak in power, only about 3 to 4 in magnitude. And this is actually because Mars does not have tectonic plates like Earth, and the tectonic plates are the reason for most earthquakes. On Mars, the actual Mars quakes are caused by the fact that, well, the planet is still cooling down, and as it cools down, it sort of shrinks in size, and this shrinking causes the outer crust to slowly shrink in size and to start cracking on the outside. And as these cracks form around the surface, they start producing various Mars quakes. And so after a few years and listening to nearly 800 different Mars quakes, 35 of these Mars quakes were actually very useful for analyzing the internal structure. And they provided all of the necessary data for the three papers that you can find in the description below. With each of the papers essentially focusing on the individual parts of the Martian structure. The crust, the mantle and of course the core. Now in terms of crust, the main discovery here is that the crust is just a little bit thinner than expected. And it also might have two or three sub-layers. So here it's believed to be about 20 kilometers to maybe maximum 37 kilometers in depth. Although this is of course on this part of the planet. It's actually quite possible that if we were to measure all of this from another part of Mars, such as for example where the ocean used to be, the crust might be a little bit thinner because we know that the ocean crust is usually thinner on Earth as well. Then underneath that we have the mantle. But on Earth the mantle is divided into several parts. There is generally the upper mantle and the lower mantle. On Mars, however, it seems to be just one thing, mantle, extending to about 1500 kilometers in depth. And today we know that one of the reasons our planet is still sort of hot on the inside and at the same time one of the reasons why our planet is able to maintain the magnetosphere is actually because the lower mantle of planet Earth have a lot of high pressure minerals on the inside that insulate the planet, allowing the iron core to stay much hotter than it would be otherwise. On Mars, however, because mantle seems to be more or less the same everywhere, it does not seem to insulate the core as well, which is maybe one of the reasons why the iron core of Mars cooled down just enough to prevent the planet from maintaining magnetosphere for a long time. But this is of course just a speculation for now and nobody really knows until further studies. But one unexpected discovery when it comes to Martian crust was the fact that it was actually very highly enriched in various heat-producing isotopes that are normally responsible for warming up the planet. It had approximately 20 times more radioactive isotopes than the mantle underneath. And this would actually explain how Mars could potentially have volcanoes on the surface in the crust, but not actually have a very hot insides. And so the Martian volcanoes could actually be the result of the activity of these radioactive isotopes from the crust itself, not really from the mantle like they are usually on Earth. 
And because on Earth generally it's associated with plate tectonics, on Mars the volcanoes might be produced in an entirely different way. Which might also explain why some of them look so extremely different from anything on planet Earth. This right here is the biggest volcano in the solar system, the Olympus Mons. And we definitely do not have anything like this on planet Earth or on any other object in the solar system. And lastly, when it comes to the iron core of Mars, first of all the scientists were able to confirm that it seems to be liquid, it also seems to be approximately 1800 kilometers in radius, and since this is much larger than the original predictions, it only implies that the core is very likely much less dense. Or it very likely contains a lot of lighter elements on the inside. Probably a lot more sulfur, oxygen, carbon and so on. The study even suggests that it could be approximately half the density of the iron core of our own planet, simply because of the enrichment in these lighter elements. And this could one day help us explain why Mars lost its magnetosphere so quickly. And so overall, so far the mission has been really productive. A lot of discoveries, a lot of confirmations and a lot of mysteries as well. But for now, the scientists are really hoping that before InSight finally loses all of its power, they're able to detect at least one major Mars quake, at least five in magnitude or possibly even higher. And this would require some sort of an explained phenomena that we've never seen before. But we know that these phenomena and these unusual Mars quakes have happened in the past simply based on observations of a lot of different formations that already exist on the surface of Mars. And so if something like this is detected, it's going to create so many different S waves and P waves bouncing off the inner core, the uh, mantle and so on, that it might actually help the scientists clearly see pretty much everything inside the planet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about Mars once again, but actually a mission to Mars that unfortunately we didn't really get to talk much about. The mission from the United Arab Emirates, and the mission known as HOPE has now recently discovered something entirely new about the planet that we didn't really know about before. Mars seems to have what's known as aurora or auroral lights as well, something that we sometimes refer to as the northern lights or if you're in the south, southern lights. But even though on Earth and I guess on other planets like Jupiter, these lights are produced in a very specific way and usually follow the magnetic lines of a planet, on Mars this actually creates a bit of a mystery, simply because Mars does not have a magnetic field anymore. And so how exactly is this possible and what exactly is happening here? And so it is a pretty interesting discovery and a perfect opportunity for me to now talk about the mission known as HOPE. The mission that was launched by the UAE space agency that was originally started back in 2014 and has only arrived to Mars back in February of 2021. We've discussed all of this in one of the previous videos that should be popping up at some point somewhere right there. But unlike the mission from China or from the United States, there was obviously no lander here. This was just an orbital mission, with the main purpose being studying the atmosphere and various atmospheric changes on the surface of Mars. Here's roughly what the orbit of uh, HOPE looks like, and this is basically the orbit it's going to have for an extremely long time. The mission is expected to last until 2024 at least, but will probably last much longer. This probe has several different scientific instruments, but one of them is specifically meant to try to detect ultraviolet radiation. And the main purpose for this ultraviolet light spectrometer is to try to study and to try to identify and also to map this relatively large halo of different types of gas, specifically hydrogen and oxygen gas, that's supposed to be surrounding Mars. Most of it is of course uh, escaping from the planet through various uh, interactions with the solar wind, but a lot of it could also just kind of stick around or possibly even create certain effects we've never really thought possible. And so this mission is trying to investigate all of this. And so while studying Mars for the past few months, it essentially discovered this. These tiny patches you see right there which seem to represent very unusual ultraviolet emissions. Emissions that seem to represent aurora very similar to planet Earth, yet very different because these are not in actual optical light. They would not be easily visible if we were to look at them with our own eyes, but they would be visible in ultraviolet light. So these are basically ultraviolet aurora, something that nobody really knew existed on Mars. But just like on planet Earth, it's believed that these are produced in a somewhat similar manner. It's very likely glowing atomic oxygen. Oxygen that's circulating very very high in the Martian atmosphere. And the other thing is that all of this was detected on the darker side of the planet. Essentially this would be only visible during the Martian night. 
And this creates a bit of an issue. The issue, of course, being how exactly is any of this produced? First of all, we know that on Jupiter and on Earth, as I mentioned previously, the aurora generally follow the magnetic lines and are generally created along the North Pole or the South Pole. In other words, if we were to look at this simulation right here, you would probably find them somewhere right here. But we know that Mars has no magnetic field, so how is any of this possible and what exactly creates these? And it looks like the answer to this creates a lot of opportunities for us to study Mars even further. Turns out that it's probably related to something known as induced magnetosphere. It sort of kind of looks like this. Now this is something that exists on other planets, like for example it also seems to exist on Venus, and generally the way that this unusual magnetosphere is produced is when the charged particles from the solar wind interact with something charged on the surface or in the atmosphere of a certain planet. Now on Venus it's generally created by the interaction of the solar wind with the upper atmosphere. But what could possibly do this on Mars? Currently the scientists believe that it's probably something to do with the magnetic deposits on the surface. This map right here created by NASA shows us the effects from the crustal magnetism. With the red patches here being much more magnetic than some of the blue patches you see on the side. With the red patches here representing the most magnetic features on the surface. This paleomagnetism is very likely the result of previous magnetic field that existed on Mars a long time ago, which essentially magnetized some of the deposits on the surface, and it's still magnetic today to some extent. Magnetic enough to produce a very very thin induced magnetosphere. And so the current understanding is that because of this induced magnetosphere, some of the particles from the solar wind get to go around the planet following the very weak magnetic lines that do exist here. Something that very likely only happens when certain conditions are met, such as for example when Mars, and specifically certain features on Mars, are pointing in the right direction. And so for example this part right here will probably produce a lot of induced magnetosphere. And so it has to be pointed in the right direction for these lines to be produced. And as these charged particles go around the planet, they then strike some of the upper layers of Martian atmosphere, where a little bit of oxygen gets to be broken up just like on planet Earth and starts to produce the UV luminescence that we get to observe. The luminescence that produces these ultraviolet aurora. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of patches all over the surface that were detected by the scientists with this artistic representation kind of showing us what it probably looks like. But I guess unlike Earth or unlike Jupiter where the magnetic lines are relatively straight, since the magnetic lines produced on Mars are very likely pointing in all different directions, the aurora that are produced are also probably a lot more hectic and a lot more irregular or strange looking in shape. And so definitely a really amazing discovery and something that the scientists didn't expect to find so soon. But because of this discovery and also because of the effects we're seeing from the surface of Mars, this could also help the scientists in the future to learn more about how Mars lost its atmosphere due to the loss of the magnetosphere which can now be studied remotely. While at the same time we can now use this to possibly map a lot of various deposits on the Martian surface and also start mapping the magnetosphere of Mars as well. Something that would be absolutely crucial for when we one day decide to move here and possibly colonize this planet. And since on Earth the color of aurora can usually tell us exactly what particles are being charged and which particles are being broken up, we can use the same observations on Mars to try to determine the exact composition of some of these upper layers. So for example here on Earth, most of these colors are formed by the breakdown of nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is normally responsible for red, blue and violet colors, so the colors you're kind of seeing right here, whereas yellow and green are usually oxygen. Although it does depend on the altitude and sometimes depends on other conditions as well. So by studying Aurora we can actually learn a lot about Mars as well. Either way, this is actually one of the coolest discoveries from Mars in the last few years and something I'm sure a lot of scientists will be talking about in the years to come. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a resolution to one of the strangest mysteries of planet Mars. And no, we're not talking about the face on Mars. This has been resolved many many years ago. We're talking about this thing right here. This really unusual cloud-like formation that you can also see in this image right here that was originally discovered in 2018 by the mission known as Mars Express. 
and was coming out of this strange ancient volcano known as Arcea Mons that we know for a fact has been dormant for basically millions and millions of years. So what's creating this strange cloud? And why does it actually look like the volcano is literally erupting? What's causing all of this and how does this all work? Well, first of all, it's important to understand that today we know that Mars is geologically inactive and has actually been geologically inactive for a very, very long time. And although it does host quite a lot of volcanoes on its surface, including the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, this monster right here is like three times bigger than Mount Everest, by the way, all of these volcanoes were erupting billions of years ago. None of this should be producing any plumes or any smoke. And so naturally, we know that this plume is not coming out of the volcano itself. Something else is forming it. As a matter of fact, it's not plume at all. It's actually clouds. It's a cloud-like formation that seems to be created by the volcano and the shape around it. And because we know that Mars actually does have clouds once in a while and the cloud formation is something that we've seen before in various observations of Mars, the question then becomes how exactly does this cloud form? And unfortunately for many years now the scientists after seeing this originally couldn't really answer this question for one simple reason. The reason being that there is just not enough probes orbiting Mars to observe when this particular cloud forms and to actually detect what exactly is happening around there. And so unfortunately when this cloud forms there are no probes there to watch it and by the time that some of the probes arrive to this area to be able to see it the cloud is already gone. And so this cloud is not permanent, it appears seasonally and is only visible during certain times of the day. And in the last couple of years, the scientists worked out that this cloud seems to only appear during the Martian summers. Interestingly enough, when other clouds tend to disappear. For example, in this image from the Opportunity rover, these clouds were captured during the Martian winter. And by the time the summer arrives, these clouds disappear. And surprisingly, that's exactly when this cloud comes out. And so the scientists behind this paper you can find in the description below decided to investigate this a little bit further and actually found archive footage from other missions including the Viking probes that landed on Mars back in the 70s and determined that this cloud has been doing this ever since then. In their paper they even have several images showing us exactly how other missions captured this cloud and that it was actually always there. But it wasn't until 2018 that we officially took interest in this and by we I mean scientific community, and essentially try to figure out how all of this works. Now one of the more interesting parts of this mystery is that of all of the other volcanoes in the region here, Arcea Mons seems to be the only volcano producing these unusual cloud formations that are not visible anywhere else. It's also the only location for any clouds close to the Martian equator. Normally a lot of other clouds form a lot closer to the poles of Mars, not really in the equatorial regions. This cloud also seems to have both daily cycles and annual cycles and so here in this picture you can kind of see how every single morning it starts with a head that appears right above the volcano which then slowly becomes longer and longer elongating to the point where it's about 15 to 1800 kilometers in length and about 150 kilometers in width. So this is actually a really long but also surprisingly predictable cloud. And then only after a few hours it sort of starts to dissipate, disappearing completely within only about 10 hours. And all of this only happens after the spring arrives to Mars when a lot of different clouds of water ice start to emerge in this particular region surrounding the volcano that's about 20 kilometers in height. But because none of the satellites were ever in this region for those specific 10 hours, it was almost impossible for scientists to figure out what's actually happening here or to observe it visually. Until one of the teams realized that they can actually use one of the technical cameras present on the Mars Express missions. This camera is known as VMC or Visual Monitoring Camera and its main purpose back in the days was to actually just observe the successful separation of the Beagle rover as it separated from Mars Express on its way to land on Mars. But it's literally a webcam, it has very very low resolution and relatively limited capabilities. Also the rover itself was unfortunately lost during the landing because apparently two of the solar panels never really opened up allowing the Beagle to operate or to even transmit any information. So the mission itself was only partially successful. 
But nevertheless, VMC was later reactivated because scientists realized they can still kind of use this camera despite its low resolution to observe Mars from the location where no other probe can see it. And this is exactly how the scientists were able to create this beautiful animation and you can kind of see that it's very low resolution but it does show us the formation and the evolution of this cloud. Although for this study the scientists also combined observations from MAVEN and MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as the Indian mission known as MOM or Mars Orbiter mission which today holds the record for the cheapest mission to Mars ever. I remember talking about this back in the days and apparently it cost less than to produce the movie Martian, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. But I guess the question is, so okay, how does this actually form and what's the explanation behind this if it's not the volcanic plumes? Well, this is known as the orographic clouds. There are a lot of these examples on planet Earth. Here's for example one from Rio de Janeiro and here's another one from Iran. All of these are formed in a very similar manner. You first need a lot of moist air in the area, you then need some sort of a large object like a volcano or a very large mountain standing in the middle and then some sort of an airflow that forces the air up the mountain. This type of an action is known as orographic lift and from the air it sort of starts looking like this. And as this moist air goes higher and higher up the mountain, at some point it starts to condense and freezes over creating the clouds. And so in this case both the pressure from underneath as well as the temperature need to be very specific for these clouds to form and to stay in this cloud form for several hours. But once the temperature changes or once all of this moist air disappears that's when the cloud dissipates as well. All of this happening pretty much every single day in springtime and in summertime and then when the seasons change all of this stops happening until the next spring. Although unlike Earth, what's interesting here is how fast all of this happens. Remember, all of this happens in like 10 hour period, which means that this cloud expands at ridiculously high speeds, up to about 600 km per hour. That's basically the speed of a flying airplane. So in some sense there are still a lot of different questions about this cloud and what exactly happens here. With the other major question being why this particular mountain and why this particular location? What makes this volcano so unique and so specific? And why doesn't this happen around other similar volcanoes in this area? If we look at the model of Mars for example, you can kind of see that there's actually four major volcanoes here. But it's only this one very close to the equator that seems to have these effects. These other ones, even though they look very similar and possibly also have a lot of moist air in the area, do not have this. So that's where the mystery is still kind of a mystery. Why this volcano is still not really certain. Also, not a single orographic cloud on Earth, even the ones around Everest, are as long, move as fast or have such ridiculous dynamics. They don't really change that fast. So whatever is happening here is actually an extreme of the solar system. So still so many different questions. But also just the fact that this is actually a water cloud is a very important sign. It of course implies that this region right here has a lot of moist air and moist air very likely comes from some sort of a water deposit nearby. We don't really know what's causing it, but it definitely makes for a good location to possibly, maybe, set up a base somewhere nearby. Assuming of course we're going to be making some sort of a colony in the future. But for now, unfortunately, that's kind of all we know. The details are actually very specific in terms of the location, the shape and the formation of this cloud, but there are still a lot of questions that we're just unable to answer simply because more pictures, more data and more investigations are needed by other missions. Maybe we'll have more pictures from the Chinese probe Tianwen-1 that's currently orbiting around Mars and maybe even more pictures from the Arab mission that's also in orbit, but for now we don't have enough information. Hello on full person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about new discoveries and a new study that suggests there's a new resolution to what may have happened to water on Mars. And this particular resolution relates to another video I made not so long ago that made some really incredible discoveries about waters of planet Earth. And in some sense these two studies relate to one another, explaining both planets really well. But let's start one step at a time. Now first of all we know Mars definitely had water, simply based on the observations from various satellites that have found several different signs of ancient rivers and even signs of ancient tsunamis 
that most likely happened on the planet when some sort of an asteroid collided with one of the poles of Mars. We've actually talked about this in one of the older videos on the channel as well. And so the presence of ancient water on Mars is not really questioned by many. As a matter of fact, most scientists definitely agree that Mars had a very large ocean that covered a pretty large part of the planet. Something that might have made it resemble this a few billion years ago. But the question is of course, how did this water disappear and what exactly happened to the planet to make this water all suddenly vanish over the past few billions of years? Now the most common explanation today involves our sun and the lack of magnetosphere on the planet. Essentially Mars lost its water, probably atmosphere as well, simply because the magnetosphere of the planet disappeared and was no longer able to protect the planet from the dangerous radiation from the sun, specifically various types of solar wind that can easily strip the planet of a lot of different particles on the surface. And because this has been measured many times, this is sort of a fact as well. But here's the thing though, was this the only process responsible for the loss of water on Mars, or did something else happen? And how much water was there present to begin with? Which is actually where this study comes in and provides some really interesting and somewhat fascinating answers. With the main summary of the study being that it wasn't just the solar winds, a lot of water was also trapped inside Mars itself, very similar to how a lot of water got trapped inside our own planet, and a lot of water is still there today. But the way that it was trapped is kind of interesting. So first of all, we still don't really know exactly how much water Mars had approximately 4 billion years ago. There is however a lot of speculation that early Mars very likely looked like modern Earth. Although possibly also with a lot more ice cover on the surface and very likely with climates similar to what we have today in countries like Iceland. But once in a while this ice would melt and would create a global ocean as well. Today however, all of the water is gone on the surface and only some water is still present at certain locations near the poles, with possibly some water being underground as well with at least one lake previously discovered there. And so naturally the previous explanation using the sun as the culprit for the reason why Mars has no water made a lot of sense. And actually still makes a lot of sense, but the problem is we still don't really know how much of the ocean was present there and we don't really know how much of the ocean was lost to the sun effects and how much of the ocean was lost to something else. But based on a lot of observations from the NASA mission known as MAVEN, the scientists over the past few years learned a lot about the interaction between the Sun and the Martian atmosphere. Specifically here, they learned how the water vapor in the air of Mars is bombarded by various ultraviolet radiation from the Sun and how a lot of this interacts eventually causing the hydrogen getting stripped from oxygen and essentially the water molecules breaking apart and escaping from the planet. Mostly because hydrogen inside water is a very light gas by itself and so it's not going to stick around the planet and essentially escapes into outer space. But today we know that there is an isotope of hydrogen known as deuterium and certain parts of water will contain this deuterium in there as well. Because deuterium is almost exactly double the mass of simple hydrogen, it's more likely to stick around and is more likely to actually remain on Mars, thus deposited in some sort of a rock or somewhere else where we can later find it. And because scientists today know the general ratio between hydrogen and deuterium in normal water, we can normally determine or estimate the presence of water on early Mars or really anywhere else for that matter using this technique. In other words, by comparing the number of deuterium to hydrogen atoms found in a certain sample, the scientists can usually estimate the total amount that was originally present in, for example, a certain sample somewhere else. And so by using various samples from various Martian asteroids and by examining the amount of deuterium compared to hydrogen in them, the scientists were able to estimate that the total amount of water must have been much much larger and the amount of water present versus the effects we're observing with missions like MAVEN are almost impossible to explain if only the sun was responsible for making Mars lose all of this water. It just doesn't lose enough water through the interactions with the sun. Something else must have happened to essentially have all of this water disappear somewhere. And the best explanation here comes from some of the younger samples, samples that are less than 3 billion years old. For some reason in those samples it's obvious the water has already disappeared which suggests that the drying of Martian surface must have happened within about 2 billion years or so. It was a relatively quick event. 
And well, it just so happens that there is a pretty solid explanation coming from this other study about planet Earth, the minerals inside Mars, and specifically minerals tend to absorb more water as they cool down. We've briefly talked about this in the previous video, when I discussed this mineral right here that's very prominent in the mantle of planet Earth, the mineral known as ring budite. It just so happens that this thing right here is able to absorb a lot of water as it cools down. Or if we look at this from a perspective of a planet that was just born, as the early planet like Mars or even Earth cool down and as the entire planet starts to slowly solidify and starts to produce all of these minerals, at some point a lot of these minerals will actually start slowly absorbing the water that's currently present on the surface. Okay, in this case it's actually a little bit too hot for water to exist. Here's a slightly more realistic scenario. So we have some liquid water here, and this water starts to slowly get absorbed by the minerals like ring budite, mostly because they tend to increase their absorption value as they become cooler and cooler. They're basically like sponges in a sense. And all of this water slowly starts to combine with minerals and eventually gets deposited deeper and deeper into the ground itself. Now on Earth, because of plate tectonics, some of these minerals will eventually release the water through volcanic activity. But on planets like Mars and possibly even Venus, where we don't really think plate tectonics ever existed, well, on these planets it's a lot more difficult for a planet to recirculate the water back into the atmosphere, and so a lot of it stays inside and slowly gets soaked into the planet itself, with a lot of water possibly disappearing as quickly as within about 500 million years, simply because Mars is a much smaller planet, so it also cools down much quicker than planet Earth. And so these minerals soaked in a huge amount of water, anywhere from 30% to up to about 99% as estimated in some of these studies. And this would hypothetically give Mars these early oceans that could be as deep as 5,000 feet or roughly around 1.5 kilometers. So essentially these huge oceans must have existed here but slowly disappeared because of the way that the rock absorbs water. And because all of these hydrated minerals were mostly older rocks, with none of them being younger than about 3 billion years old, it means that Mars lost water really, really quickly. Also, of course, implying that Mars looked like this for possibly a pretty long time. Possibly over 3 billion years, actually. And the results from the study also resolve a lot of different mysteries, including the discrepancy between deuterium and hydrogen, including the calculations from the amount of water stripped from Mars today, and the discrepancy between the expected amount and the amount observed, and also huge rivers and huge seas and oceans that used to be present on the surface, which would not really be possible if Mars had just a little bit of water like some of the early studies predicted. And the implication here is of course that a lot of this water, possibly most of the water on Mars, is still actually still there. But this time it's trapped inside the rocks. And well, this unfortunately doesn't help us at all. What I mean by this is that, let's just say we hypothetically landed on Mars and wanted to get some of this water out of those rocks. We would have to bake those rocks for a very, very long time using a lot of energy, and it would be very difficult to recover even a tiny bit of water from those rocks. Going back to Ringwoodite, for example, by weight only about 2% of the entire mineral here is water, and you need really high temperatures and pressures to basically try to extract the water from there. This here, for example, forms at about 2000 degrees Celsius and really high pressures inside planet Earth. And though maybe in the future there could be some techniques, for example, using lasers or something really powerful to extract water from those rocks, right now there's really no efficient way to do any of this. The water there is really stuck for possibly forever. Without some sort of a volcanic activity, without a lot of interaction inside the planet, trying to retrieve this water just like it's retrieved on Earth by the volcanoes is pretty much impossible right now. Nevertheless, this is an awesome discovery and it also explains a lot of things that we observe on Mars, observe on planet Earth, and also maybe answers a few questions about Venus as well. But this is something we'll discuss in some of the future videos. Hello one full person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the mysteries of the origin of water. That element that we all take for granted because it's pretty much everywhere on the planet, and we're also made out of it, for the most part. But where exactly water came from, and how it appeared in such quantities on the planet, has actually been a mystery for a very long time, and still has no definitive answer. And even though by mass Earth contains about 0.02% of water, 
Despite the tiny amounts of water present, it's an essential element for everything we know around us, including of course life and including of course intelligence. But water has been continuously lost to space for billions of years. As a matter of fact, the sun's radiation breaks down the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen then escapes into the depths of space. And so when trying to calculate how much water may have been lost uh, by using, for example, isotopes of xenon, the scientists discovered that at least an entire ocean worth of water has been lost since the creation of the planet. And interestingly, the scientists today believe that even when Earth was extremely young and very, very hot, because of the pressures from the CO2 atmosphere and because of the overall conditions, even though the temperatures were about 200 to maybe 230 degrees Celsius, there was actually enough pressure to maintain the liquidity of the oceans. In other words, despite the bombardment from the sun, despite the ridiculous pressures and temperatures, liquid water existed on the planet for a very long time, with maybe only one period when it wasn't actually possible during the collision with Theia when the moon was created as well. But despite this, we still don't really understand how water came to be and where it originally actually came from. But there are two major theories. One says that Earth always had water, it was basically created with water and water was present from the beginning. The other says that it came through asteroids and various collisions from outer space. Although initially we also thought it was maybe comets, because comets do contain a lot of water, but the water in comets apparently is very different as we discovered once we studied them in more detail. And one of the biggest confirmations of this was during the Rosetta mission when the probe established that the water here is extremely different in terms of the isotopes and composition. The water on Earth is very unique and it's not the same as the one in the comets. And so the new assumption was that, well, it could have come from asteroids. And so various asteroids started to be studied and the scientists tried to analyze and try to discover water in some of the asteroids to see if any of them match with the water found on planet Earth. Now obviously today we know there are a lot of different types of asteroids, some are more metallic, some are more rocky, some are more icy. And the assumption was that maybe we're going to find the same water as we have on Earth in these more icy asteroids. But so far the results have been kind of negative. So it was actually kind of surprising that even the icy asteroids don't seem to contain the same type of a material, the same type of water as we have on Earth. What's even more surprising, very recently a study came out studying the so-called Enstatite chondrite meteorites, which are actually known for being extremely dry. But some of the more recent analysis suggested that these extremely dry asteroids do seem to contain enough hydrogen and enough other material to hypothetically bring about three times more water than we currently find on Earth, assuming of course periods of billions of years and a lot of these asteroids coming to Earth over time. And surprisingly, the isotopes of water found in these asteroids and also even other materials seem to kind of match what we find on our planet Earth as well. In other words, the assumption that these asteroids are extremely dry was kind of incorrect. They do seem to contain just the right amount of water and just the right kind of water. But they are relatively rare. They only make up about 2% of all of the asteroids we usually find on the planet. Nevertheless, by analyzing the minerals present in these asteroids and comparing them to the ones on Earth, including the isotopes of metals like calcium and titanium, all of this was matching with what we have here on the planet, suggesting of course that these unusual dry and somewhat rare asteroids might actually be responsible for water after all. And what's more, they also seem to contain nitrogen. The mystery of where nitrogen came from is yet another mystery that we have on our planet. Nitrogen is an extremely important component, it's the biggest component of our atmosphere, and its origin has always been a mystery. But these asteroids also seem to contain enough nitrogen to explain where it came from. And so it looks like the mystery might have been solved, but wait a second. And then another paper came out. Paper claiming something completely different and presenting a very valid point, and also using an asteroid, but this time a very different asteroid, a very ancient asteroid, one that came from Mars. And it's of course the paper you can find in the description below that deals with a different type of an asteroid known as Northwest Africa 7034, unofficially nicknamed Black Beauty. I guess because it's black and because it's kind of beautiful. This unusual asteroid, as I mentioned, came from Mars and was most likely released from the surface of Mars via an extremely powerful collision. Now obviously we don't know what collided with Mars, but it was a very powerful collision, coming from most likely this region you see on the screen. 
And because of the age of this asteroid, we think that it happened about 4.45 billion years ago, when the solar system was extremely young and Mars was only about 90 million years old. In other words, when Mars may have looked something like this. Okay, possibly not exactly like this, this is just an illustration, but it did seem to possess liquid water. At least that's what it seemed like when the scientists analyzed this asteroid, discovering that it contained chemical reactions that most likely were happening inside the very extreme, very hot conditions during the collision, but also in presence of water, liquid water. And it also, once again, contains water as well. As a matter of fact, it seems to contain the most water of any asteroid we found coming from Mars. And because this is the second oldest meteorite we've ever discovered, and it does have a lot of water on the inside, this of course is a very interesting discovery and an extremely important piece of puzzle to try to understand where water actually came from. Because once again, what this implies is that approximately 90 million years in its existence, Mars already had liquid oceans on the surface. And considering the previous explanation, this would not be enough time to bring so much water to the surface of Mars through simple asteroid or meteorite collisions. So this implied that the water was already there from the beginning, from the creation of Mars during the early solar system. And the implication from this discovery suggested that as the planets are created, as the terrestrial planets are created, in this case Venus, Mars, Mercury, and of course Earth, may have already contained water on the inside as they formed from the protoplanetary disk. And eventually some of them, like Mars, lost this water, but some, like Earth, maintained it for a very, very long time. And by analyzing this rock, the scientists established that it wasn't just water that was present there, but also quite a lot of oxygen, huge amounts of oxygen. So in that sense, it does give us a pretty interesting picture of early Mars, which wouldn't really be far off from what we see on the screen here. Mars may have been very similar to what Earth looks like today. And the other implication here is that because of these various collisions and because of all of this activity in the beginning, many different greenhouse gases may have been released and produced just the necessary conditions for Mars to maintain liquid water and habitable conditions for at least a few hundred million years, possibly even longer. Also confirming something that we've known for a long time, that Mars has an extremely fractured surface up to about 10 kilometers in depth. So basically all of this indicates that Mars received a lot of collisions and many of these collisions created very interesting conditions on the surface, including liquid water. But with time, all of this was lost, creating the Martian surface that we know today. And so both of these ideas and both of these theories do make sense. There is evidence on both sides. Yet there is no definitive answer of where the water came from. Because there is enough evidence to suggest it was on Earth and it was on Mars from the beginning. Evidence that is very obvious in the Black Beauty meteorite. Yet on the other hand, there is also evidence from these very dry chondrite meteorites. And the evidence here is also quite suggestive. And so maybe the best explanation so far is, why not both? Maybe it started with water already being present and maybe more water was added and some more water was released through various collisions over time. But even this idea right now still needs more evidence. In other words, because of this meteorite here and because of this recent analysis, we're sort of back to the original mystery of not really knowing where the water on Earth came from and what managed to maintain it for so long. But we're getting closer to this answer and more of these studies and more of this type of analysis is needed to try to figure out what exactly is happening here. Hello and Person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about Mars and Martian discoveries. And this whole week I wanted to focus on various discoveries coming from this beautiful red planet, mostly because of the incredible success of the Perseverance rover that just sent us this beautiful first picture from planet Mars. Or essentially because of the success of the mission itself. As you probably know if you've watched the NASA stream or if you joined my stream at the same time, the mission was a complete success. The probe managed to land very successfully and almost exactly in the spot where they were planning to land. And because of this, it's also very important for us to understand what this mission is going to be discovering on Mars and what we might discover in some of these unusual deposits inside the lake crater where the probe landed. And the first research I wanted to discuss is in regards to the ancient atmosphere of the beautiful red planet. 
it seems that there is actually something similar between how Martian atmosphere was in the past to how the Earth atmosphere was as well. We know, for example, that one of the reasons why Mars has this unusual color is because it has an oxidizing atmosphere. In other words, it's the atmosphere that produces rust. When iron mixed with oxygen, create iron oxide or ferrum oxide. And for Earth, this oxidizing atmosphere existed here for at least two and a half billion years. We know that all of this started happening after the very famous event, known as Great Oxidination Event, that started approximately two and a half billion years ago. Here's a rough graph showing us that about two and a half billion years ago, we start seeing the beginnings of this unusual stage. It progresses very slowly at first, and then explodes approximately 900 million years ago, reaching the peaks right around here, which is, I guess, about 400 million years ago. And so, for example, certain rocks that are about 2.1 billion years old, like this one right here, will often have these very specific patterns formed by these initial oxygenation events that acted on various metals inside the minerals. This event is also officially known as Great Oxidation Event because that's when oxidation of various rocks on the planet began as well. Now, the thing about this event is that we are pretty sure we know what started it. It was most likely cyanobacteria, or the early versions of bacteria that started to produce oxygen as a kind of a byproduct, or essentially as a waste of their photosynthesis. Now, for cyanobacteria back then, there was a lot of food available everywhere. There was a lot of carbon dioxide, there was probably also methane and a lot of other components that it can use for photosynthesis. And of course, there was a lot of light and a lot of water. All of this eventually resulted in cyanobacteria producing so much oxygen that it most likely caused a lot of other species to disappear completely, mostly because oxygen is also somewhat toxic to, well, pretty much everything, even to us. From what I remember, if the oxygen levels reach about 4 atmospheric pressures, in case of a pure oxygen at least, it also becomes toxic to humans as well. So in that sense, this great oxygenation event, or the oxygenation event, uh, it's a really difficult word to pronounce. Anyway, so this event most likely resulted in the first very large extinction of various uh, unicellular or very simple species. But it also produced a lot of new species, all of which started to use oxygen for their own needs. Now, this was a very monumental event for the planet, and it also most likely changed the color of the planet as well. The color of the oceans and possibly a lot of other stuff on the planet very likely was purple back then, and the reasons for this are explained in one of the previous videos somewhere right there. However, following the event, because of all of the oxygen and the lack of CO2 and possibly lack of methane in the atmosphere, Earth only stayed this way for a very, very short time, very suddenly turning into a snowball Earth, basically an ice-covered planet. This was because the lack of CO2 that was consumed by all of the cyanobacteria and the overabundance of oxygen lowered the temperatures dramatically. Now, all of this is not really a fact yet, but this is the most accepted version of the events. Following this, though, we know that Earth transformed again, eventually becoming habitable, and in the last 800 million years, the life here exploded. All of this was, of course, the events that followed the transformation of our atmosphere. Now, we're not really talking about Earth, though. We're talking about this little guy, Mars. It just so happens that we know that the atmosphere here is oxidizing right now, but was it different before? And it turns out, according to the study that, as always, you can find in the description below, the answer is yes. The atmosphere of Mars also transitioned from being reductive, or reducing, to oxidizing. And all of this happened slightly before planet Earth. And what's more is that this study is actually kind of brilliant in the way that it was conducted. It required no actual physical sample collection from Mars, and only required the surface scans that were essentially conducted from the Martian orbit by one of the wonderful orbiters in orbit of Mars that can easily scan Martian ground and even penetrate it as deep as 10 meters. We have very similar devices orbiting our own planet, and we also have very similar devices orbiting around the Moon. And for this particular mission, the scientists used one of the probes orbiting Mars and used an instrument here that uses infrared technology to penetrate the upper surface of Mars and is able to reveal various types of minerals and a lot of different geochemistry going on inside this ancient rock here by studying the molecular vibration of material present on the surface. And by collecting all of this infrared data, they then compared the similar data here on planet Earth, basically from similar satellites that orbit our planet. The scientists here used very similar volcanic rocks from the Hainan Island in China. These are volcanic rocks relatively similar to the rocks we found on Mars and then compared these rocks to what they were able to see on Mars as well. 
And the conclusion here is pretty obvious. The conclusion suggests that Mars also had this oxygenation event sometime in the past. But in case of Mars, it most likely happened 3 to 4 billion years ago. So possibly 1 to 2 billion years before the one on Earth. But since we know the oxygenation event on Earth was biological in nature, there are going to be a lot of questions now trying to figure out what exactly happened on Mars to result in this relatively similar event happened here as well. And based on all of the observations of Martian surface, we know Mars looked very different in the past. Something like this, but probably even something a little bit more extreme. And all of this water and thick atmosphere was very likely at first reducing, so it probably had things like methane, things like hydrogen gas, possibly even carbon monoxide, but definitely very little carbon dioxide and very little or possibly even none oxygen. And these huge amounts of methane most likely also allowed Mars to have relatively warm atmosphere. Methane is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. However, then something changed. Mars started transforming and, well, it's obviously unclear what caused all of this, but it started changing quite dramatically and eventually started to oxidize as well. The atmosphere started transforming, became more oxidized, the water started to disappear, and eventually the rocks started to oxidize as well, turning the planet red as it is today. Which also, of course, suggests that the color of the actual regolith on Mars most likely was different color as well. All of this redness probably occurred way afterwards. But unfortunately, there's very little we know right now. The only thing we know for a fact, and this is based on the observations reported in this particular study, is that, well, the oxygenation event seems to have happened on Mars as well. And by the way, here's what the scientists had to work with. This is the picture from Earth, and they compared this to the data produced from Mars. But what exactly caused the event, and also why Mars changed so dramatically afterwards, those are not the questions we can answer right now. It doesn't really have to be biological in nature, it could have had some other unusual or possibly still not explained phenomena happening. And this is why Perseverance rover might help us answer all of this once and for all. But if we do discover some sort of a bacterial life hiding inside the Martian regolith, and if we find signs of life from the past, it would actually answer everything all at once. All of the mysteries of Mars, all of the unusual observations like, for example, the methane cycles and a lot of other unusual observations like the results from the Viking mission on Mars about 40 years ago that may have discovered signs of metabolism or at least some sort of a bacteria that was doing something on Mars, all of these signs would suddenly make sense. For now though, well, as always, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Perseverance might be the one to find all of these signs for now, we don't really know. There might be a different explanation to what happened to this beautiful planet. But anyway, for now, that's kind of all we know. It's definitely exciting to know that Mars has undergone very similar changes to planet Earth. And it's also kind of important for us to realize that maybe, just maybe, this is actually what our planet Earth is going to look like in a few billion years as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you're seeing right here is the first ever picture taken by the Perseverance probe after it landed on Mars. And that's because today, once again, we're going to be talking about discoveries coming from the beautiful red planet. A lot of new studies and a lot of new exciting experiments have actually been conducted in regards to Mars, mostly because it looks like we might try to go there after all, at least in the near future. For now though, we can actually try to study what's going to happen here, especially if we decide to colonize this planet. In today's video though, we're talking about this really exciting experiment with really exciting results. Results that indicate there might be a way for us to bring certain types of bacteria that create oxygen on planet Earth and to have them operate and create oxygen and a lot of different important nutrients on Mars. And as always, you can find everything about the study and the experiment, including the results, by reading the paper in the description below. Now, our story today starts with the surface of Mars. We always believed that this was a very inhospitable place. The atmospheric pressure here, for example, is only about 1% of planet Earth, even less than that actually. It mostly contains CO2, carbon dioxide, and small amounts of nitrogen, argon, oxygen, and a few other elements. For the most part though, over 95% of everything is essentially CO2. And we know that on our planet, CO2 is used by various organisms, including something known as cyanobacteria, to essentially produce oxygen and to produce a lot of nutrients that are often used by other bacteria and other different organisms. Cyanobacteria, as a matter of fact, are responsible for producing a huge amount of oxygen on our planet. 
And although a typical algae bloom, as it's known, is sometimes toxic, mostly because it also does produce some toxic elements, at the same time, it's also responsible for a sudden burst of various very needed elements, including, of course, various sugars, including oxygen, and a lot of other elements that are used by different types of animals in the food chain. But generally, for algae to do this, to bloom and to create oxygen, it just needs a little bit of nutrients, specifically a little bit of nitrogen. It also needs a lot of water, it needs sunlight, and temperatures and pressure necessary for water to stay liquid. Now, technically, the temperatures on Mars do actually reach uh, relatively warm conditions. It gets to about 30 degrees Celsius here, or about 86 Fahrenheit, at least in some parts. But it also gets really cold. Now, the problem is that even in the warm temperatures here, you cannot really have liquid water. The pressures are just too low. Although, I guess it's maybe not entirely correct to say that it's too low. If we look at something known as the triple point graph, also known as a phase diagram, we can actually see the point where the water can become liquid and can maintain its liquidity. The temperature for this point is just a little bit over 0 degrees Celsius, with the pressure being around 700 Pascal. Actually, maybe a little bit lower than that, it's about 650 or so. Now, it just so happens that the average surface pressure on the surface of Mars is currently about 610 Pascal. So it's just a little bit below that. It's literally just a little bit below the necessary conditions for liquid water to suddenly start existing on Mars. That of course suggests that if the pressure was higher, let's just say a few million years ago, it may have actually had liquid water in some places. But the pressure here does differ quite a lot, and in higher elevations especially, on some of the larger mountains, like the biggest volcanic mountain, the Olympus Mons, which, uh, okay, that's my bad, it's actually not here, it's somewhere right here. For the Olympus Mons, the pressure on top here would be much, much lower, possibly three times lower. And so because of this, the possibility for liquid water to currently exist on Mars is pretty low. But nevertheless, what the scientists in this particular experiment decided to do is, well, they kind of cheated a little bit. They decided to see if you can still have very similar conditions other than pressure. They basically raised the pressure just a little bit. Well, actually, okay, they raised it about 10 times higher. It was roughly around 10 kilopascal, which means that they now had quite a lot of opportunities to have liquid water on the surface, with the evaporation point being roughly around 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Which means that now the water could suddenly exist in liquid form. And so what the scientists in this paper did was essentially create this new reactor known as ATMOS that allowed the scientists to control the inside parameters extremely precisely. They chose nine specific conditions representing different types of atmospheres and slightly different nutritious conditions including one with a lot of nutrients and one that kind of resembled Mars but with a lot more nitrogen. And as I mentioned before, instead of using the exact Martian atmosphere, they used exactly the same amount of CO2, but added a lot more nitrogen, increasing the total pressure to about 10 kilopascal. And then they introduced the inhabitants of these capsules, the cyanobacteria known as Anabena. And Anabena itself deserves a separate video because it's a very interesting cyanobacteria. For example, we know that it's capable of producing um, neurotoxins and often uses those neurotoxins to control the entire ecosphere where they're located. Essentially, they prevent certain um, animals, like fish for example, from uh, overtaking the environment. They don't do this on purpose, obviously, this is just a side effect, but they're really good at doing this nevertheless. They also tend to grow in filaments and create these relatively large strings and in some sense can also be called plankton because larger animals do eat them quite a lot. So they're basically very nutritious, they're also very useful to feed other animals, but also they're extremely good at fixating um, nitrogen, at basically taking nitrogen and turning it into something useful. And so by creating conditions that are similar to Mars but with a lot more nitrogen, what the scientists discovered is that this particular species was thriving in it, it loved it. Not only did it survive, but it basically lived there as if it was regular conditions on Earth. And though obviously the same bacteria in the Earth-like conditions were also thriving as well, it was really surprising to find out that the bacteria living in low-pressure Mars-like conditions were actually just as successful at doing everything they were supposed to do. And then they actually went even a little bit further. They dried all of these cyanobacteria and used it as a kind of a feed for the most famous bacteria, E. coli. 
Now, E. coli, despite having a somewhat bad name in the press, is actually really useful for different things, including producing medicine, including producing a lot of other elements that we usually need for survival, and we generally can genetically modify them to produce whatever we need. For example, there are already several techniques that have been developed to use E. coli to produce insulin, and also a lot of different vaccines and a lot of other things like biofuels and so on that can easily be coded into the DNA of this particular bacteria in order to produce pretty much anything relatively fast. Which means that by combining E. coli with the wonderful Anabina, we can technically create a really, really efficient factory on any planet, any moon. You have Anabina producing all of the nutrients and all of the oxygen first, and then E. coli takes all of this and produces something else that we need. This is actually not a very difficult process and it's been done here on planet Earth many times. But because of the overall toxicity of Anabina, this could also be not even the best cyanobacteria for all of this. There are so many different choices we have, which means that a lot of new experiments using this Atmos reactor will most likely be using other conditions, other bacteria, and of course, possibly even discover something else, something as incredible. But I guess the next question is, well, so what does this mean for Mars? It still doesn't mean that cyanobacteria can survive here just by being placed on the surface. But if we bring cyanobacteria here and we add just a little bit of pressure and possibly give it just a little bit more nitrogen and possibly even give it some other resources, they can thrive here pretty easily. This obviously doesn't mean that we're going to be terraforming Mars or that we're going to be producing massive amounts of oxygen here anytime soon yet, but it is a good first step in trying to discover if we can actually do this at some point. And although Mars is definitely not going to look this way anytime soon just yet, by conducting these experiments and by essentially publishing these papers, we're technically getting closer and closer to that moment when we can discover something that can help us, well, I guess you can call it terraform another planet. And also it's super important to remember that cyanobacteria in general is essential for everything on Earth. It was responsible for the so-called Great Oxygenation Event, it was responsible for transforming the entire atmosphere of our planet, and it was also responsible for providing most of the, if not all of the, early oxygen to the planet. All of the life that followed depended on cyanobacteria for the survival. So maybe, just maybe, we might find a way to take all of this and to then bring it to another planet, hoping that something similar might happen there as well. Now, for all we know, it could be Mars, but possibly some other object somewhere else. Which is why these experiments are so crucial in helping us understand how far we can take science in order to help ourselves in reaching new heights in terms of space exploration, space colonization, and potentially terraforming a completely new world. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to return to planet Mars and talk about some other incredible discoveries from some of the recent studies. This time, we found even more unusual underground liquid water lakes. And at the moment, some of them don't really have a very good explanation. But more importantly, it actually opens up an entire opportunity for us to possibly easily colonize this planet in the future. And that's of course for one very important reason. We know that Mars has a lot of water ice, but we never really knew until recently that there's also liquid water deep inside. Something that the scientists discovered back in 2018. And even though originally the scientists weren't really sure if this is what they're looking at, over the past few years the scientists discovered even more of these unusual formations, which only seemed to reinforce the idea that there is definitely a lot of unusual liquid water underneath the Martian surface. But I guess the first question here would be, well, how is it even possible, and can liquid water exist in these conditions? Which of course are some of these questions that the new study tries to tackle as well. Well, first of all, we know from examples here on our own planet that it's possible for liquid water to exist really deep underground even in super super cold conditions. The best example here is Lake Vostok located in Antarctica. And so when the radar signals that were bounced off the surface of Mars revealed unusual shiny patches inside the surface of Mars, the patches that you kind of see right here that made the radar bounce off a little bit more than usual, Based on what we know from our own planet, the scientists instantly assumed that this was very likely liquid water deposits, but it was very difficult to explain how it's still possible. Over time, more and more of these patches were discovered underneath the surface, suggesting that there were actually these patches of unusual liquid formations located at different depths underneath the Martian surface in various places. But unfortunately, discovering more of these patches only created more problems. 
some of the regions where the water patches were discovered would be very, very cold, almost impossible to explain how anything liquid can actually exist there. Even briny water, super, super salty water that can usually exist in liquid form at super low temperatures, would just not be able to exist in these very cold temperatures, suggesting that there was some sort of a mystery. Either A, this was not water, or B, something was keeping the water liquid by warming it up. Something geological, some kind of a volcanic activity. And because the recent discoveries and the recent analysis suggest that these patches are pretty much all over the surface of Mars, it sort of implies that either liquid water is everywhere on Mars, or maybe these radar signals are caused by something entirely different that we just don't really understand. Which kind of would make sense, I guess, simply because of the technique used here. So generally the way that the scientists try to detect all of this is by scanning the surface with radar. The radar usually goes pretty deep inside the ground, but certain type of materials underneath can actually reflect it much easier than others. From doing this type of a scanning here on planet Earth, the scientists generally know what kind of reflections they'll get if there is some sort of an underwater deposit, and these reflections definitely match the ones from Mars. And for the past 15 years or so, NASA has been continuously scanning the surface of Mars, specifically actually using a mission known as Marsis, the mission that was able to cover a very large part of Mars, including the South Pole, where a lot of these unusual lakes were discovered. Now the thing about the South Pole is that, well, it already has ice on the surface. It sort of kind of looks like this. And this of course also implies that it's very likely much colder here. And a lot of these newly discovered patches close to the South Pole of Mars were actually much more shallow than some of the previous discoveries. Here the depth was less than one kilometer, less than about half a mile. And this means that the temperatures here would be very, very low, around minus 60 degrees Celsius or about minus 80 Fahrenheit. And although hypothetically it is possible for water to maintain its liquid form if we add a lot of salt into it, and here we're talking about salts like calcium and magnesium, in this case there were also several papers that did suggest it's almost impossible for liquid water to exist under the South Pole without something heating it up. And the best possible explanation for what could heat it up would be some sort of a volcanic geological activity underneath. But the problem here is that, well, we don't really think that there are volcanoes in the South Pole of Mars. No South Pole volcanoes have ever been discovered. As a matter of fact, the entire surface here is clear of any volcanic activity, and the only known volcanic features on Mars are in much higher latitudes. And so it's very difficult to explain what can possibly warm up this liquid water. The natural geothermal heat is unfortunately much lower on Mars than on Earth, so it would be impossible for it to provide enough energy. And so because of this, the scientists find themselves in a bit of a pickle here. It's a mystery that nobody really has an answer to. It seems to be liquid water, but if so, what's keeping it liquid? And if it's not liquid water, then what exactly is causing these reflections that appear to be liquid water? Reflections present pretty much all over the surface of Mars, or technically underneath the surface. Here we're talking about depths of anywhere from just a few hundred meters up to about four kilometers. But for now, a lot of scientists still want to believe and want to make an assumption that it is liquid water after all. It just has some sort of a mechanism to keep it warm. And if there is so much liquid water underneath the surface, it obviously presents an excellent opportunity for a lot of future manned missions. By being able to extract this liquid water from underneath the surface, we'll be able to definitely provide enough needed resources for a successful manned mission to Mars. And this is of course one of the better discoveries coming from this unusual and somewhat hostile planet. Although I guess at the moment it's still very difficult to say exactly what it is and if it's going to help us colonize Mars or if it's going to help us discover something else really unusual.